Okay, I think we can start. Eduardo, I'm looking at you for any signals. Yes, you can go. Okay, perfect. Welcome everyone. Um, welcome back for some of you. This is the second day of our International Symposium Textile Heritage for the 21st Century, exploring the potential of a new analytic category. Um, we started yesterday with an exciting, exciting keynote by Professor Yutke Deneke from uh, MIT, Boston. Um, now, for those of you who could not be here yesterday, my role right now is just to provide a very short, concise summary of um, what was discussed yesterday. And then I will just leave the floor to Eduardo to introduce our second um, guest keynote speaker. Um, so, Professor Deneke yesterday kicked off the symposium with a really wide ranging and thought provoking discussion um, of many challenges and potent potentialities that a new perspective on heritage and texts could bring about. Her lecture basically mobilized um, very many different disciplinary approaches and suggested a, the development of a more trans academic cooperation as she called it. Her case studies uh, exemplified our shared concern with the place of the past in what, what she described as our present presentist age. Um, so I'm not going to say much more about that. Hopefully you will be able to watch the, the recording of yesterday's um, and today as well uh, in the coming weeks. Um, however, we were very excited to see that the topics that were uh, that came up through the keynote address were later picked up by our um, three speakers yesterday. And also we were pleasantly a little bit surprised, although it was, it was by design to some extent, we were pleasantly surprised to see so much continuity among the, the three speakers and the keynote. So yesterday, Professor Stephen Nelson and Gayatri Ayer and Vanessa Paloma, Paloma Albas uh, were um, sharing very many similarities among those uh, among their presentations. We were happy to notice in particular a strong continuity between all of their methodological orientation toward particularly the embodied dimension of various kinds of texts, although they did discuss different kinds of texts from written sources to architectural and archaeological materials and findings. One more interesting aspect that we were happy to notice is the significance of movement in the context of uh, research on textual practices. Um, this, is, this is both movement in time and in space. Um, perhaps this, this um, topic of movement will be picked up again by Professor Harvey in a moment. Um, and so, with this, I just would like to leave the floor to Eduardo to present Professor Harvey, and I welcome all of you once again, and thank you for joining us. Have a pleasant second day. Thank you, Andrea, for introducing this second day, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, so our second keynote speaker today is David Charles Harvey is Associate Professor in Critical Heritage Studies at Aras University, Denmark, and an Honorary Professor of Historical and Cultural Geography at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. Actually, uh, during our informal talk yesterday, uh, Professor Harvey stressed the fact that he defines himself more as a geographer than as an heritage scholar. I think uh, th this was just out of modesty as his work has contributed dramatically to some key heritage debates, including processual understandings of heritage, extending the temporal depth of heritage, uh, the outlining of heritage landscape and heritage climate change relations, and the opening up of hidden memories through oral history. Uh, Professor Harvey's work indeed has a focus on the geographies of heritage, but the reason I bumped in his work is not geography, but history. Uh, 
He is indeed the author of a couple of pioneering articles about the concept of history of heritage that deeply influenced and informed the preparation of this symposium. Um, I guess that the concept of a biography of heritage uh, about which he will talk today is probably an extension of that idea of the history of heritage, we, we will see. Um, I think it will be also a good connection with some of the issues raised by uh, Professor Deneke yesterday, and as well as the other uh, speakers. Uh, just a quick mention to Professor Harvey's recent books, uh, The Future of Heritage as Climate Change, Loss, Adaptation and Creativity in 2000, 2015, Commemorative Spaces of the First World War, Historical Geography at the Centenary in 2018. And the last one, I suppose, is Creating Heritage, Unrecognized Pasts and Rejected Futures. Um, that is, I, I think, of 2000, this last year or early this year, last year, I guess. Um, he is on, also on the editorial boards of five journals, including the famous and uh, renowned International Journal of Heritage Studies. And he also co-edits um, uh, quite new, but very interesting book series, the Bergham book series, Exploration in Heritage Studies, together with Ali Mozaffari. And today's lecture is titled Myth, Reality and Revelation, Tracing a, a Biography of Textual Heritage on, on Dartmoor. So, Professor Harvey, you have 45 minutes plus 15 minutes for questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, for a lovely, uh, very kind introduction. Um, I'm very pleased, finally, to, to be able to speak to your group, actually. Uh, I've, you've, I've, you've, we first of all made a connection during the Association of Critical Heritage Studies last summer, uh, and uh, I was keen to come along and, and uh, act as a commentator but it turned out where our sessions were at exactly the same time and we couldn't, I couldn't, yes. I couldn't actually come and visit. So it's, got, so it's, it's really good. I've got, no, uh, I've got no clashes. It's just a shame we can't do this in, uh, in Venice. I, I sort of missed, you mentioned tiramisu yesterday and I was thinking, where, where's mine? I, uh, we, I couldn't, we couldn't have it, but uh, maybe, another, maybe another time. So uh, sharing screen, uh, move, ooh, move this. Ah, that's, that's, not, that's not Denmark. Um, that's Norway, actually. Here we go. That's better. So, uh, um, yeah, thank you very much. I'd like to, uh, you know, it's been a really good conference so far, actually, thinking about it. We had some really lovely papers yesterday, as Andrea talked about, and, uh, and you yeah, know, lots, so much to things to think about, some of which I'll try to develop a little bit to, to, uh, over the next 45 minutes or so. Because I think I can see lots of connections all the time about intertextuality. Um, there's a couple of things which is which in some ways surprised me in terms of how much they came up. But just thinking about it, just how important these elements are, and that is the is, I guess the the intermin the conversation between the personal and the professional for ourselves, uh, you know, practitioners and scholarship and so on. And I think therefore it is worth me saying a little bit about myself, uh, you know, as a geographer, my background, um, I, and I guess. My connection to this sort of this 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 particular topic is that it's uh, it's all set on a moorland area, very close. I'm from originally from West Cornwall, in the the far southwest of of the of the UK. Ooh, no, no, get, I'm leaving. Let's get it going. Yeah, yeah, that's better. Uh, in the far southwest of the UK is Cornwall. I spent 30 years living in Exeter, just here, and this is this area of moorland here, which is an area I love going walking on. And I guess as well, this sort of speaks towards uh, issues about you know, some of the stuff I was raising yesterday about the location of some of these, some of these stories and the connection, uh, you know, the, sort of the, the spatial contextualization as well as the temporal contextualization and the, the landscape contextualization in this place comes through very strongly. Also worth mentioning, I should have, I should have said this earlier, actually the one before, uh, this is part of a project that uh, this, this paper comes from part of a project that I've been doing with people on the Past in Its Place project, which is based at Exeter. And this particular element was very much done alongside Joanne Parker from the Department of English at Exeter University. 
and you'll see some cartoon images. There's a friend of ours uh, who's an archaeologist who does cartoon versions of, ex of, ex of excavations, Hannah Sackett, and, and we got talking and the, the, the story is a splendid story. And uh, we ended up thinking that, uh, uh, or she was, she was very keen to do some, some cartoons to go alongside the story, to illustrate the story. And so I'm using those here, which I think in some ways is quite, um, it's quite faithful to this idea about uh, of the sort of different investments of practice and scholarship and, and, uh, uh, and the stories we talk about as part of this endeavor. So this paper explores the life history of an event. This is a great big storm which took place in October 1638 up on Dartmoor in the southwest of, the, of England. And I'm going to trace its biography as represented in various texts over the following 380 odd years. It's a great story, uh, but uh, is the story of the story is also fascinating. The story of how the, the story changes and, and develops in dialogue over the ensuing centuries is fascinating. It reminds me of the anthropologist Barbara Bender notes about how the, exp ex the exploration of sequential narratives of the past can bring a site uh, to life. And then correspondingly, I think by tracing the life history of this 17th century storm event on Dartmoor, I'm hoping to produce a lively story that is productive. Versions of this story are written up in various texts over the immediate just few weeks, few months following the event, and then again and again over the centuries, and they reveal a dynamic effective register as meanings and interpretations change. It changes from a performance of it all being about the performance of divine power, the power of God uh, uh, as witnessed through this great big storm, to being a demonstration of natural phenomena, of ball lightning, to being a sort of pantomime of magic and stories of the devil, romantic stories of the devil. And it's repeated in poetry and prose, newspapers and pamphlets, quasi-scientific treatises, folkloric writings, and tourist guidebooks. Uh, yeah, the written archive comprises a diversity of textual heritage, but uh, yeah, written by different people at different times and for very different audiences, the narrative of the event can be placed within changing social and cultural contexts. Furthermore, however, the memory of this event can be found in material form for public viewing literally through a church memorial uh, through which recounts the story on the uh, which can still be seen on the on the walls of the church at Widdicombe uh, which is the, the 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 village at the center of the story here or high up on Dartmoor about 350 meters high um, uh, but also the mythical qualities of the event have been inscribed upon the landscape through its association with some strange archaeological features that still aren't known to, still, still uh, are puzzled about to this day. So if you visit Dartmoor, first of all, there's always, there's this invitation to step back in time. It's a landscape with, which, is, which is full of various sort of palimpsests of previous generations, of previous uh, workings of people living on the land, sometimes in terms of ancient field systems here, uh, or Bronze Age memorials, you can see at the bottom left here, but also it's a landscape full of natural, in inverted commas, natural tours, this sort of very distinctive granite uh, piles of rock and stone sticking out the top of the, of the, uh, of the, of the highest hills, which uh, again have caused a lot of uh, controversy about what they're, how, how they're formed and lots and lots of legends surrounding them. So it's a... Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a landscape which has an effective atmosphere, I guess, that, that the past becomes tacitly present, sometimes in a visceral, even a jarring and uncanny manner. As, as well as the blurring of temporal boundaries, Dartmoor is also composed in a manner that blends myth and reality. It's been produced in, in tourist literature more recently as a place of legends, peculiar and, un, and seemingly unaccountable remains and features on the moorland, such as the Tours fables, strange geological features, ghosts, witches, enchantment. It's a place for the, a space for the imagination, a space for magic. It's, a, it's no, you know, not surprising that it's the, it's the landscape in which the Hound of the Baskervilles is set. Uh, Arthur Conan's Doyle's Sherlock Holmes story, his most famous Sherlock Holmes story. This is a story as a fictional detective uh, talking about a fictional hound that is based upon various real legends. 
And indeed, so Sir, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of The Hound of the Baskervilles, actually donated a third of his royalties from the original serialized versions to various folklorists on Dartmoor as a, as a, in, ter in terms of nodding to that, uh, the, the power of the, of the legends of this place that, uh, and you know, the real legends, if you like, the real myth uh, that supported him writing this, his story about, uh, about the Hound of the Baskervilles. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, a very interesting place. I'm doing a bit of tourist brochure here myself. There's a, there's a sort of the, the going to Widdicombe in the Moor, which is where this is a, the, the, the church as you now see it. Uh, took this photograph a couple of summers ago when the last time I, I was able to visit it. And it's on the, on the walls of the church tower, which is where we'll show, I'll, I'll show you later on a memorial, written memorial to the actual events. But let's go to the actual events themselves. So uh, the, the main source I use for this is actually the, there's the much longer, there's the second edition of this, uh, this account, a second and most exact relation of the, those sad and lamentable accidents which happened in, uh, in and about the parish church of Widdicombe near the Dartmoors in Devonshire on Sunday the 21st of October last, 1638. So uh, it was upon... Uh, the 21st of October last in the parish church of Widdicombe, there fell in time of divine service a strange darkness increasing more and more so that the people there could not, could not see to read in any book. This is the quoting from here. Uh, and to sort of illustrate this, this is where the, the uh, uh, sort of cartoons of Hannah Sackett are quite useful. Uh, suddenly, in a fearful and lamentable manner, uh, a mighty thundering was heard, strange lightning therewith, greatly amazing those that heard and saw it, the darkness increasing yet more till they could not see one another. The extraordinary lightning came into the church so flaming that the whole congregation was presently filled with fire, uh, the whole church was presently filled with fire and smoke, the smell whereof was very loathsome, much like unto the centre brimstone. Uh, some said that they saw a great fiery ball come in at the, at the window and pass through the church, which so affrighted the whole congregation that most of them fell down into their seats. Uh, uh, oh, carried away there. Most of them fell down into their seats, uh, um, some upon their knees, some upon their faces, some upon another. At the great cry of burning and scalding, they all gave up themselves for dead, supposing that the last day of judgment was come and that they had been in the very flames of hell. Uh, the, the actual minister Lid, who was the, the presiding minister at the time, he writes up, up about this in the parish records, and it is it, it's recorded in the church records that four people were killed during this, the, when the debris from the roof fell in, uh, and a further two deaths occurred over the following few days as people were, were succumbed to injuries that uh, they, they uh, they uh, had the misfortune to receive during the actual storm event. Um, it's also one of the very earliest archival records, accurate archival records, that is thought to have been ball lightning, which is a really odd event. I've tried to look up lots of physics uh, journals and so on about it. And even today, when you look at the latest physics research on, on ball lightning, people are a little bit puzzled as to what it is because you can't really set your instruments to, to take account of it because you don't know when it's going to happen. So most of the experiments are done by accident and then physicists trying to work out what just happened. And there's still a lot of, there's still a debate about what exactly ball lightning is and how it happens. But from reading these contemporary accounts, you can understand the uh, congregation's astonishment here. The minister lid, we can see here in cartoon form, his wife uh, actually got killed, got set on fire in front of him. Uh, as as the, the text says, uh, the lightning seized upon poor minister, uh, the minister Lid's poor wife, fired her roof and linen next to her body and her clothes to the burning of many parts of her body in a very pitiful manner. Beside another woman adventuring to run out of the church, had her clothes set on fire and was not only strangely burnt and scorched, but had her flesh torn about her back almost to the very bones. One more man, his head was cloven, his skull rent into three pieces, and his brains thrown upon the ground whole, and the hair of his head through the violence 
of the, of the blow at first given him did stick fast unto the wall of the church. Now, this must have been quite a, uh, a shocking experience. Uh, you can see there's a sort of congregation uh, suffering from trauma, uh, but there's also drama in all this. And of course, a combination of trauma and drama sells newspapers and pamphlets. Uh, we get a sense of this. The first account of this storm, uh, which happened the 21st of October, 1638, printed in London on the 17th of November, 1638. And this was attributed to Thomas White and a master Rothwell. It's quite a short account. It must have sold out within a, just a couple of hours because a, no, a second edition of it, exactly the same as the first edition, was reprinted on the, the 19th of November. So still under a month from this event, there's still already two, uh, two versions in circulation in London. Uh, then this one comes out on the, the, the second and most exact relation, much more detailed, printed 10 days later at the end of November, 1638, and this is the one I'm, I'm pulling most of the quotes from. Uh, this account is again attributed to Thomas Wykes, but this time it's proclaiming that the account was not uh, grounded on information taken at second hand, but instead contains first hand accounts. Those persons now being come to London who, who, were, who were eyewitnesses herein and the chiefest discoverers of the effects of the terrible accidents. Uh, and in sort of true tablo tabloid style, I guess, it actually says on the inside page here, although thou hadst the truth in part before, yet not the tide thereof. So it's sort of real sort of, sort of you know, speculation of, of sort of building up the, the, the drama around it. I don't know, in some ways it reminds me of sort of like the Oprah Win Winfrey in interview with Meghan and Harry reported on again and again, just first as trailers and little bits to titillate the view viewer before the whole thing being shown. Uh, so clearly in the 10 days between the first account of this and, seven, and the 17th of November and this account, which, is this, which is, uh, comes out on the 27th of November, there's enough public interest in the Widdicombe storm to, to warrant this big publication. And by the sounds of it, the cost of transporting witnesses from Devon to London, which was no mean feat, it had probably been quite an expensive, uh, uh, an expensive uh, outgoing to, 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 to undergo to bring people from Devon to come up as eyewitnesses to, to, uh, to where the money was in London. This new and improved account is a much more expensive than the earlier one, and it claims greater authority. It makes a great big deal about the eyewitness accounts and it, sort of it... Uh, um, you know, that, that, it's, that there's, uh, that there's you know, a huge amount more detail involved. It talks a lot more about the actual structure of the church, about the nature of the congregation, the names of people there, much more detail than the first version, uh, and a much more close detail about the way the lightning bolt ricocheted around the church building and took out the lime and sand of the wall. So while the terrible event is put down to the performance of God's power and judgment, there's also a sense of fascination, unusual elements. Some people are being burned and others not. Uh, metal objects are melting, skin is scorching, but sometimes clothes is un are untouched. In other words, the textual biography of this episode is already changing over just the first few weeks after the event. And so one should locate this textual heritage within a okay, realm of understanding that the world's end was nigh, God's judgment is impending, but there's also a sense of wonder and of curiosity of the of strangeness, uncanniness of events and effects. It talks about how uh, one mistress Ditford sitting in the pew with the, the minister's wife was much scalded, but the maid and the ch child sitting at the pew door had no harm. Uh, one master Hill had his head suddenly smitten against the wall uh, through the violence whereof he died that night but no other hurt was found upon his body and his son sitting in the same seat had not any harm at all. So the implication places the event squarely, squarely within the realms of God's providence, but within this fearsome astonishment and trauma about the end of the world, these contemporary accounts contain elements of everyday newsworthy sensation, but also a sense of curiosity and, a, and something a bit further. White's talks a lot about in this second one where by now the people are coming up to London to tell people about what's going on down in Devon. Uh, and he talks about how the multitudes who came to Widdicombe over the few over the week following the storm to view the damaged church, they just came as tourists. We go and see, wow, I've heard about this church being struck. 
let's get up there and have a look. Uh, and they came from diverse places thereabouts, suggesting that it had become a bit of a local tourist attraction already. Um, furthermore, uh, I think one can almost detect a sense of scientific curiosity, uh, perhaps even a, a recourse towards reason within some of these things. There's some sections of the pamphlet come across almost like an unspoken conversation between ideas about divine revelation and a sort of quasi-scientific autopsy of the event. There's a local man, David Barry. Uh, he ventures uh, up the dangerously damaged tower. He actually goes up with uh, one of the local ch church wardens. Uh, who The church warden gets too frightened on the first floor and runs back down the stairs because he can't dare, bear, bear to go on. Uh, but David Barry carries on going up, to, going up to the church tower. And at the top, um, as he says, he finds a round patch as broad as a bushel which looked thick, slimy and black, and black around it, uh, to which he put his hand and he felt it soft and bringing some thereof in his hand from the wall came downstairs to the people, showed them this strange compound, all much wandered th uh, thereat and were affrighted, none knowing what it might be. David Barry here seems to have interpreted the event as a, sort of, as a natural phenomenon, describing, collecting, measuring, uh, taking samples, displaying for an assembled audience this strange compound created by the ball lightning. And the investigation carried out by David Barry has in some ways the hallmarks of positivist science and suggests the development of an enlightenment for empiricism. But ultimately, however, the ball lightning uh, was not really understood uh, as, uh, as anything other than the, the undiscerning vagaries of dis divine justice. Divine justice is unambiguous. And you can see these, these opinions being expressed right from the very start. The minister, George Lidd here, uh, he's the one who he watches his wife being set on fire. But while he's doing so, he said, it is best to make an end of prayers for it is better to die here than in another place. Uh, and to which the audience uh, the responds by saying, but they looking about them and seeing the church so terribly rent and torn durst not proceed in their public devotions, but went forth of the church. It's, I think it's a, it's a really, it's almost quite comical uh, uh, sort of set of lines here that it's almost like the, the minister in the, in the midst of all this chaos is saying, it's, it's no better place to die than inside the mother church to which the, the congregation gets up and saying, well, I'm off then, <laughs> run. And so they all run out for their lives with the church masonry falling about them. And this is all faithfully reported in these texts in the, in, you know, the just three or four weeks later. So clearly the immediate reaction from members of the congregation appears to reflect more earthly instincts than poor old minister Lid, who, as we said, had just been, he just watched his own, watched his own wife being set on fire. But uh, um, so how else is this? Yeah, this is the immediate reaction through pamphlets of the of the sort of like the new the immediate newspaper versions of what of the event uh, over the following few weeks. You can then trace how this event becomes picked up by various uh, other writers over the following decades, uh, and you know, very quickly this 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 whole episode um, comes out to uh, you know, is is it comes out in poetic form. And the first person who writes about it is George Lidd, the, 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 the church, the minister at, at the church. Uh, two, or, two or three, we can't quite work, quite work it out, two or three of the people who are actually at the event wrote up about their own accounts about it in, in poet, poetic form in the, in the immediate few weeks, which were published over the following few years. George Lidd was the, the most famous of them, but there's no, there's no original version of, the poet, of his poem uh, survives. It only comes through in much later in 19th century copies. Um, but he says, you know, he's, he's, uh, uh, he's a, the, the man officiating at the time of the thunderstorm, and he is claimed to have written this poem, which basically ends with, oh, blessed be God forever, bless his name, which hath preserved us from that burning flame. Oh, let the voice of praise be heard as loud as was the thunder breaking through the cloud. Oh, let the fire of our devotions flame as high as heaven pierce the celestial frame. So in other words, you know, God's judgment, but also God's mercy. Uh, and this is very much reflected still in the last few lines of the, the Reichs and Rothwell piece. Uh, where they talk about, you know, this is the sum of that terrible accident, the terrible example happening in the place foresaid. 
from lightning and tempest, from plague, pestilence and famine, and from battle and murder and from sudden death. Good Lord, deliver us. Now, at some point in the next few decades that Richard Hill, who's the village schoolmaster, I don't think any relation to the man Hill who had his, head, who had his brains thrown onto the floor, um, but uh, he writes up a four verse poem in rhyming couplets and uh, writes them up onto tablets and displays them on the wall of the restored church. And probably the sort of 1680s, 1690s, we can't quite work out when. The tablets were definitely there in 1701 because they get talked about. Um, at some point after 1701, they fall apart, uh, but then they were replaced in 1786. And so the ones you see there today, which you can still go into the church and look at, uh, the, this dates from 1786. There's no, way, no, it, there's no way of knowing whether these verses that you see there now were, were changed at that time, but we think it you know, is probably a fairly faithful uh, um, reproduction of, the, of Richard Hill's poem, the schoolmaster's poem, that was put together in the, over, the, over the, the first couple of decades after the storm. Um, you know, and he, you know, this one starts, as you can see, uh, and up here, you know, in, in, uh, in token of our thanks to God, these ta tables are erected. Who, this one works a lot better if you speak it with a Devon accent, which I can't do all that well because I'm, I'm not from Devon. But, you know, uh, in token of our thanks to God, these tab tables are erected, who in a dreadful thunderstorms our person's ear protected. Within this church of Widdicombe, amongst many fearful signs, the manner of it is declared in these ensuing lines. And so while the account doesn't include the quasi-scientific investigation that is reported in White's earlier account, there is clearly a fascination of the un unusual effects of the lightning. We sort of zoom in here and we can see this bit I've circled here. One, one man had money in his purse, which, was, uh, which melted was in part a key likewise, which hung there too, and yet the, the purse no hurt save only only some black holes so small as with a needle made some lightning some say no scabbard hurts but melts and uh, breaks and melts a blade in other words it's melted this this lightning is melting the the metal but not a, not affecting the the textiles uh you know there's a hint of dialogue as well that seems to redeem the parishioners of widdicombe i suppose this the, this table is put up in widdicombe church so it's not going to be about all oh, you sinners. You're all you've all had it. There's, there's, they're going to have a slightly different story for the for the people visiting the church every week. Uh, you know, in, the, in contrast to the 1638 accounts published in London, rather than simply proclaiming that the congregation were being punished as sinners, it's all about God's judgment. There's an element of the tablet that now implies the lightning strike was perhaps natural, and that God was actually trying to protect the people in the church. And you can see that here. Uh, you know, the wit of man could not cast down, as it reads from the top, the wit of man could not cast down so much from the steeple upon the church's roof and not destroy much of the people. Uh, but he who rules both air and fire and other forces all had us preserved, blessed be his name, in that most dreadful fall. Uh, if ever people had a cause to serve the Lord and pray for judgment and deliverance, then surely we are they. So that's the, the sort of, well, 1786 version, which is up on the uh, within the church tower. But it's certainly, the, a version of this was certainly there in 1701, probably a good, a good bit earlier, written by the schoolmaster of the later 1600s, this Richard Hill. Um, the person who visits in 1701, John Prince, reports about him seeing the, the uh, he, he reports that the, the, these tablets exist in the church tower. But he doesn't think much of the, the rhyme at all. He, doesn't, he, he looks down upon it. He's quite a, an elite. He's a much more uh, elite person, John Prince. And he doesn't like this. He doesn't even write out that, doesn't even lower himself to write out this such terrible verse. Instead, he produces his own verse where uh, uh, he has his own sort of theological uh, uh, cause. He asserts, asserts that, um, you know, the uh, that is you know, very often the wrath and justice of Almighty God, for it is certain that what one truly observes, such dreadful thunders, lightning, uh, such dreadful thunders and lightnings don't arise by chance. In other words, uh, you know these these people really were sinners, these, these locals. Nor ought to be nor ought to be put referred to pure natural causes. 
uh, Almighty God permits the prince of the power of the air to array storms and tempests and to scatter abroad thunders and lightnings to mischief what they can, the children of men. We doubt not but he, that he uses the evil ones as his beadles and lictors to execute his wrath upon the children of disobedience. He's quite damning of the people in Whitaker, actually. Uh, but Prince builds upon earlier descriptions in suggesting that the storm was an act of divine punishment. But now we've got a, this sort of extra ed element here about the, the, there's a sort of suggestion that the devil is coming in here, the prince of the power, the prince of the power of the air is about the is starting to talk about talk up the devil but basically prince's introduction of this of the devil into the story begins to have a much more strong uh, influential legacy this the worthies of uh, of devon this 1701 publication was widely read until the 19th century at least uh, and the account of the storm mostly re-quoting this this john prince account is comes up in at least five or six 18th and 19th century texts that talk about this this uh, story in more detail but thereafter uh it, it basically repeating the, the 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 john prince line really but thereafter things shift a bit in the early 19th century and if we sort of take a step back and the sort of the the this is a this is a moment in the early 19th century where dartmoor stops being a place of sort of and the either sort of isolated moorland you know repugnant horrible moorland where nobody would really want to visit and horror and so on and it becomes being a, a, a one of the key places of the of the sublime this is the romantic moorland filled with curiosity and wonder and enchantment we need a slightly different story for this and the devil fits in really well to such a story and so from the mid 19th century we suddenly get a shift here a bit more that the that, that uh, uh, you know, this is much more the 19th century version of the storm. Uh, it it, it uh, raises this a very different, you know, the, it brings in the devil, an anthropomorphized devil and a story about gambling sinship and gambling sinners. Uh, best uh, related in 1876 by the local historian Robert Dimond, who made a conscious attempt to commodify the storm, when he, when he produced a history of Widdicombe, it sold out. Yes, it sold a lot of copies in the from eight, in the eighteen seventies, um, and he draws from earlier poems. He's a bit obscure where he gets it from. He talks about it as being from Minister Lid, but he's the first person to talk about this Minister Lid actually writing to this 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 poem. Um, but he uses this to to as a backdrop to legitimise his story about the devil, which really starts to dominate things. He's a little bit ambiguous in a way here, paradoxically talks about it being both God and the devil's orchestration of the storm. The Lord was pleased for to direct the stones so as not to hurt, much less to break men's bones, nor was the devil or idle all the season, the prince that ruffles in the airy region to set on work what wit and malice might act or invent to end our days outright. So now the, the prince that ruffles in the airy region, in other words, the devil, is uh, suddenly takes center stage. So from the from the later latter half of the 19th century, this is the the the, the rise of sort of romantic Dartmoor. So again, we can recount the story. The 21st of October, 1638, the devil comes to Dartmoor. Rather than going to Widdicombe to just smash the church down a bit, he first stops at a pub. Why not? So uh, uh, the barmaid at the Tavistock Inn in Poundsgate knew he was the devil. And you can still go to that. There's the, there's the Tavistock Inn in Poundsgate. Uh, very nice pub if anyone's in that part of the world. Um, and uh, the devil goes there and he, uh, he asks, he asks, what, asks uh, um, uh, yeah, the devil rides in, goes into the pub uh, and uh, asks her, the road to which is the road to Widdicombe. So this is a bit of a rubbish devil. He doesn't know his way to Widdicombe, so he asks at a local pub. Unwittingly, she tells him and was immediately horrified at the liquor that which he drank, hissing as it passed down his throat. Uh, seeing that he was discovered, the fiend galloped off in the direction of Widdicombe. So this is sort of an extra episode to sort of to, to build up the, the build up the story a bit. Um, so she guessed he was the devil because the beer sizzles in his throat. He paid with gold that then turns to leaves. 
And then he had cloven hooves. For some reason, they didn't notice that when he walked in. But by the time they, he'd had his pint, they thought, oh, he's got cloven hooves. So he runs, he, he, he legs it and they realize it was the devil. So then uh, uh, this story, which although uh, um, it gets, gets uh, talked up by Dimond originally, Samuel Rowe and William Crossing both, both wrote really influential tourist guides to Dartmoor in the later 19th, very early 20th century. And they, they sort of solidify this story now. The story is, is not, no, it's very much the devil. We get a named person now as well, Jan Reynolds. There was a Reynolds uh, who lived in the, um, at the, in, the 16, in the 1630s, who was a local uh, warrener, uh, like a rabbit farm owner. I don't think we don't think that he was caught up in the actual uh, in the actual storm itself. But now, for some reason, the devil and Jan Reynolds, who's a gambler whose lucky streak was about to run out. So the, again, we've got the storm coming down on the day. Uh, the devil is on his way. He calls in at the pub. He asks directions because he didn't know where Widdicombe is. He arrives at Widdicombe. He's come in search of Jan Reynolds. Here he is. He arrives at Widdicombe. Uh, he comes in, breaks in through the through the church because he'd come to collect an overdue debt. And he finds Jan Reynolds sitting at the back of the church playing cards like an idler. And then he picks him up, takes him away, and is never seen again. But now we've got another added element to it at the end of, the, of this new story is that Jan Reynolds drops his cards, his paying cards, and the symbols on the cards that fall from his hand turned into stone enclosures that are on the moors and they can still be seen to this day as a warning. And this is part of the sort of tourist guidebook. Um, as, uh, and this is, the, you know, this is the, uh, the romantic Dartmoor of Conan Doyle and of the Hound of the Baskervilles. Uh, and, uh, um, and there is the, the devil's playing card. This is a, a, the diamond, obviously. And you can, as an explanation, for the tourists visiting Dartmoor in the late 19th, early 20th century, now we've got an explanation of, of some of these early interesting enclosures. So rather than the whole episode being seen as a performance of divine power and the unquestionable evidence of God's wrath, here it's all, all about the devil. But this devil is a sort of trickster variety uh, and he's quite comical really. He stops off for a pint at the pub. He has to ask for directions of how to get to, to Widdicombe. He's a bit of a rubbish devil. Uh, but he's, he entertains, he's, he's a, you know, he entertains the tourist imagination that is yearning for this enchantment. So rather than a devil that can astonish and generate terror, this is a devil who can entertain while being a little bit scary for an audience of well-to-do tourists who are fascinated by Dartmoor landscapes and folk tales, having read Hound of the Baskervilles uh, and other, other noted books in the late 19th, early 20th century. They want to be enchanted. But as we can see, there's a further element is it, which explains this enclosure or as a set of four enclosures, one in supposedly in the shape of a heart, uh, a club, a spade, and in this case, a diamond. And they are strange enclosures, actually. We, you look up for the, you look these up on the official archeological uh, records today. This one in particular is uh, archeological record 134765. And it actually notes it has an approximate diamond plan so it's quite obviously the diamond um, and the further notes talk about it having no visible enter entrance but this is but we do not know why so it's a field with no entrance which is a really strange looking field and they and they have ended up with just a few question marks 18th 19th century question mark don't really know so it's a sort of nobody really knows this the the outline of this so why not put it down to the devil uh, so along the way the fact that the stories of the devil are based unequivocally on a real event just seems to be lost. Uh, but the, casu the, the casualty is, a, is, is lost as a casualty of how narratives change over time to suit circumstances. But it's a little bit frustrating in a way that the, 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 the need for a good story about the devil and the devil's playing cards actually obscures the probable real origin of these four fields in question. Because far from being an isolated and wild spot, Throughout the 19th century, up until the 1920s, uh, th this area where the devil's playing cards are located was, a, was the center of copper mining. It was the home to dozens of minings, uh, miners, hundreds of people who, who now, this is an empty patch of moorland and enchanted and sublime and so on and so forth. But uh, you can still wander around if you know where to look and find various archeological, uh, uh, archeological remains of the tin mines and copper mines of Dartmoor. Um, 
So there's a hint of irony that behind all these stories of romantic mystery, there's the sort of shadow of other people's lives on the moor, the marginal people, marginalized stories, the lives of copper and tin workers, of the birch tor mines and the golden dagger mines and other, other, other important mines. So, you know, the public want mysterious Dartmoor. They want Dartmoor of folklore and legends and good stories. And they don't want Dartmoor about tin miners who are living pretty rough lives in a pretty, in a pretty nasty spot. But it's important to, you know, not to forget that this is not an empty place. It's actually really busy in the late 19th, early 20th century. There are hundreds of people living in this area, digging out, you know, scratching, literally scratching a living for themselves. It doesn't fit into the sort of national park idea about wilderness and wildness of Dartmoor. And it's interesting, just last week, um, I heard a story about sort of lockdown and the pr national, you know, pressures on landscapes, national park landscapes during lockdown. And there's a, the warden from Dartmoor National Park came onto the radio talking about exactly this valley, saying about how last summer during the lockdown, the COVID lockdown, there's, people couldn't go abroad. So people just desperately get it, or the local people were desperately wanted to have a bit of a holiday. And he said, I counted over 100 tents in this valley. Uh, and he said, this was meant to be an empty valley. And it's, it's meant to be wild. This is one of the last wilderness zones of Britain. And I was sitting there listening to this on the radio, almost shouting at the radio saying, it, it isn't a wilderness. This was, an, this was an area where literally hundreds of people were living, digging for, digging for copper and for tin just a hundred years ago. You just neatly forget about that because the story of the devil and romance and wildness is so much, so much nicer and it so, sells so many more tourist brochures than, and postcards than stories of 10 miners. So, conclusions. You could say that the, the 1638 storm provides a sort of symbolic capital that was developed and deployed in numerous ways, forming a sort of dynamic, uh, textual heritage with an ongoing life history is now nearly 400 years in the making. There's elements of this textual heritage were represented and used to suit different needs over in different times. And these need in, needs include keeping a congregation of people going to church, keeping them on the path to salvation with stories used as evidence of God's, of the power of God uh, and the power of the devil at different times and in different ways. You've also got the in the shadow of these ideas about God and the devil, the extreme rarity of ball lightning. It was recognized at the time as being a really clear, sorry, a really rare event. Very, it was very clear at the time that people were puzzled by this and they had a sense of curiosity. So what happened there? What's just happened? We want, we didn't, we don't really know. And there's a, there's a sort of sense of curiosity that heralded a, a sort of nascent scientific investigation even in the, the week following the event itself back in 1638. But in addition to these quasi rational and theological reflections to the nature of the world, you've also got this event provides a useful resource for storytelling. It feeds a market for sensational news stories in the 17th century, but it also feeds a market for romantically desirable stories about magic and myth that to enchant readers and tourists alike in the 19th and 20th century. And furthermore, through recourse to myth, the event was used to account for four strangely shaped fields. Indeed, there are parallels between the conversations between archaeology and folkloric magic in the 20th century uh, as, a, as a similar conversation between theological reflection and the vestiges of science in the 17th century. So you see the life history of this great storm of 1638 shows a dialogical form of heritage a chiasmus that blurs time frames, myth and reality in a fluid and folded manner. You could say it's a story of intertextuality, a dialogue between church and science, between folklore, tourist literature, ghost books, and more ordinary people trying to make a living in a challenging and marginal landscape. So uh, this is a character I met last time I was walking around there. Um, the, the fields were under question are just behind him. I wasn't going to go and I wasn't going to go and argue with him. Um, but uh, you know, there's a sort of points of conversation between the tangible and the intangible, between fact and fiction, uh, witnessed through texts in various forms, different narratives, and different uh, offering different forms of legitimation. So the sort of religious authoritative narrative of heritage, with the evidence being re re recourse towards the Bible, or the sort of scientific narrative of heritage with evidence towards empiricism or nascent empiricism. There's a sort of non-elite 
narrative perhaps of evidence towards the archaeology, the, the, the fields and the remains that you see around you. And there's also a, a romantic tourist narrative of heritage uh, as evidence through folklore. And I'm trying to think sort of placing that through to some of the papers yesterday as well is the sort of, I think some of the things getting from this is how the importance of placing these stories in context, both temporal context, but also a spatial context. Uh, the location matters and the movement of stories from one location to another location, from Dartmoor up to London and beyond, really matters here. There's a, so we've talked a lot about intertextuality and there's a conversation or dialogue between elements. Uh, there's also a space of, uh, there's a lot of work going on in the margins, which reminds me of a couple of the papers yesterday, the marginalia, not the stuff in the mainframe, but the stuff on the edges, the asides, the stuff overlooked. Uh, the people who often get ignored, maybe touching upon one of the questions yesterday, this maybe isn't so much a, a question about representativeness versus the exceptional, maybe more a question about the quotidian and every day against an elite, uh, or at least within those sort of conversations in dialogue. Uh, you can see, so you can see about the past as a reservoir of a symbolic capital which has power, which has agency in a dynamic manner, and as a really shows the 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 utility of a biographical frame of reference and a biograph, you know, life exploring the life history is really important. And I guess in saying that, we can see that uh, uh, this this dialogue is not a new thing, but it can be traced into the past, into the deep past over the last three or 400 years in this case. So that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Harvey. My first comment is wow, because um, it, from the title, it, it may, may seem that your talk was about a very local, actually it, it is about a very local and um, specific episode so I was not not really worried but I was guessing if everybody uh, working on other areas may be interested in this in this specific case but actually you put on the on the plate so many uh, questions that are, are of course um, transversal are, are 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 very central in what textual heritage may mean First of all, so uh, I guess there are many questions. So I, I ask everybody that has something to 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 ask to write it in the in the chat or just raise the hand or as you wish. I, I just add a little uh, comment just to, to give the the, the kickoff is that um, the, the concept of biography uh, upon you 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 created your talk. Um, and is the, the, the relationship between history and biography. So um, I, I think that biography it has the meaning that we are talking about a living being. And that's perfectly understandable if we know that intangible heritage, especially is, is not a thing, but is a verb, is something that is living. So I, I just, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I got it in that way. So I was, guessing what's the, the relationship between biography and history of heritage that is another, you know, the topic of your previous research is the same or how are, are different? How, how what, what it changed when we, we talk about biography and history? And, and we have already other questions, so just, but we have time. So, so yeah, so, yeah, yeah. biography, this is something I go, is, it reminds me of some of the things yesterday as well as sort of sometimes there's a sort of question about uh, history with a capital H and history with a small h or uh, yeah. and uh, um, I guess I'm generally more interested in, well, I suppose I, I, I'm interested in the history with a small h but in some ways it's, there's, a, there's a conversation between the way in which pe things get told all the time um, and I guess yeah I don't know the the uh, um, what normally gets counted or not counted as history is the, is the is this I suppose the space for for legends and the power of stuff that may not have actually happened I suppose the, that uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah the devil didn't really come to Dartmoor but did he yeah as I said as a yeah. in terms of the power the power of the of the thought that devil the devil was in Dartmoor and stopping off for a pint at the Tavistock Inn and you can go into the Tavistock Inn today 
and read all about how the devil stopped off there in 1638. And, uh, and that it's both, well, of course it's not true, but of course it has yeah. power. And as a sort of, and it's, it's difficult how to, how to, to place that in a, in, in a realm beyond the sort of, I suppose that this is where I'm attracted to it as a as sort of heritage biographies. The, yes, yeah. maybe. Yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah, thank you. Maybe it has something to do with what you mentioned, the relationship between fact and fiction, tangible, yeah. intangible. But anyway, I don't want to monopolize the, the, the talk. So um, if, if it's OK for you, I, I'm going reading out Rio Dajima. Or if you want to just turn on your microphone and, and camera, you can. O Dajima-san. Or if not, I, I just read it. We, we can just read it from the from the, the chat. Uh, the question is about the relationship of the textists with the tourists mm. who visit the landscape. I read the story of Stonehenge saying that tourists uh, come visit Bremen by different reasons. In the case of Dartmoor, who visit the site and for what reasons each mm. person comes and what does each tourist find with the site and the textual evidence about the mm. site. Any example of tourists? Yeah, the, it's, this is interesting where it's, but you, it's like having cake and eating it sometimes because if you look around on the tour, the, the, there, is a, there, is a, there is a small group of industrial archaeologists who will come to Dartmoor mm. to find out about the tin miners and they'll look at those fields. And it, it's probably the fact that these were, there were people living in these high valleys they needed to protect their, they were probably scratching some, some gardens, very simple gardens, they needed, there weren't gates on any of the, of the enclosures because they needed to keep rabbits out. There are lots and lots of rabbits there. So, and, the, and so they did their best to stop the, stop the rabbits getting in and eating their crop. And, there's, and people are actually knowledgeable about this and interested in it. But at the same time, the, the vast majority of tourists, I think, are coming to Dartmoor because this is, they, they see it as one of, one of England's last wildernesses in inverted commas. And it's the sort of yeah. empty space. And this is a, this is a, a, a landscape where you can drive around on completely open moorland roads. And that, and it, for me, it really did strike last week. I was listening to the radio in the morning and they're, they're, yes. the, the ranger on and they're sort of, this is, this is meant to be an empty landscape. You can't have people coming here and, and camping here and littering it. And the sort of, and, and you know, this is meant to be, this is meant to be wilderness. And, and uh, that's the way and it, it wasn't was presented. It. Yeah. Uh, it was, yeah, it, that, that makes me, Think that uh, another comment uh, comes to my mind is that uh, textes and so also the the, the romantic uh, this narrative of the place changes that the the shared memory. So the image we have that people have about a place uh, independent uh, without connection to the historical fact. So mm. um, that is maybe an in another interesting point of textes. Textes are not just uh, being by themselves, they work and influence the, the memory uh, in this continual, I don't know, spiral of so mm -hmm. that the memories are embodied in texts, but the texts influence memories. So uh, I, I think there is so much to, to say here. Mm -hmm. It touches on uh, the, the Heidi Book Al Albulet's question there as well, in a way. Yes. The, the, yeah, the, the drawings and thank Hannah Sackett for that, which is interesting. That was a conversation with my, I had with Hannah Sackett in a pub in Dartmoor and uh, she was just really, really inspired by it. So she came, I didn't know she was gonna be doing that. And she came back and said, oh, I've done these drawings about it. And, uh, oh, brilliant. And, I, and I've, I'm done, I thought, should I put them? Because it's, uh, should I put them in a talk? It's a, it's, a, it's a proper academic paper. And I thought, no, no, it sounds, it's, it's, you know, it sounds much better. I haven't got dry ice and lightning. I can sort of fl I can do in the, <laughs> on the background. So instead, I'll use those. I use those texts. I think it's faithful to the idea about how to 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 play with some of these yes. stories. And you know, think I, I really appreciated the the, yeah. the visual the visual presentation. It was really nice. And I see that Professor Benecke has the uh, a question. I suppose so. I ask you to open your mic, and um, if you may, I think it's. Okay. okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking us on this ride. This is such a wonderful story, especially those parts <laughs> and the landscape features. Just really, really wonderful. Um, I, so 
I'm kind of organizing my question into actually three parts. And one, one part was actually a little bit about the context of this, this case study now of textual heritage. I wonder how much, uh, how much do you know about the station No, I mean, obviously for this to be a tourist attraction, uh, you needed these texts to circulate more broadly, but was that a regional thing or much more local to some degree? So it is a little bit about uh, circulation. Then also, who, who audience of this? Now, obviously the locals, <laughs> they needed to find an explanation of what happened and to kind of come to terms as almost kind of a coping literature. But then you showed very beautiful, you know, how there was really this kind of commercialization and um, and, and this touristy aspect to it. So that was definitely beyond the local, no? Mm -hmm. And then I wonder about the authors. You said about Robert Dimon, no? And John Price, I don't remember what you said, but he was kind of a local historian. Um, I find this really interesting that, you know, you, you, you have poetry too done by people who are actually kind of just locals and feel like they're right in that genre. So my question there would be more generally like, what are the genres involved? You had pamphlets, no? Mm -hmm. uh, you had poetry, you had the tablets in the church. What's the role of printing? Without printing, obviously this wouldn't work probably to some degree. Uh, so that's, that's actually about the context now. Um, and then the second and third question I actually kind of go together. I was also very struck by your use of the term biography. And I had to think yesterday to um, Professor uh, Elbaz's paper about the eulogy of the variant also. Uh, I wonder whether you use biography because this is so much about a conversation almost between people. No, there's an event at the core. And then there is kind of an evolving life dialogue. You talk about this as kind of a life, um, you know, life history almost. Um, so, so I wonder, again, this goes back to Eduardo's point, you know, what, what is historiography? What is then this biography? To, 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 so this wonderful case study and just said also, you're more interested in, the, in history with a small age, so to speak. How, I mean, you, you gave us, a, I think, an example where really heritage studies, we had this discussion yesterday, very much brings out voices that wouldn't be there otherwise. otherwise. Now also with the songbooks, and I think in other contexts, we talked about this, uh, this idea in heritage studies, also memory studies, to really bring in voices otherwise that wouldn't be heard, you know, <laughs> um, in other disciplines and so on. And uh, I wonder, I mean, how does this um, corpus of textual heritage you delineate interact with a lot of other textual heritage around it, starting with, of course, the Bible, uh, any kind of, you know, uh, the type of preaching in that area, you know, mm -hmm. that might have been commentaries or other kind of uh, dialogues, you know, of course, about, you know, religious issues. And then, of course, with poetry at the time, no? Uh, I mean, you mentioned Doyle, that is kind of the end of the with the romantic Dartmoor, no? Mm -hmm. But I really wonder, this kind of popular, quotidian story-making you're showing us here, how do you place that into broader context? And how can we, this is the question of scale again, no? Mm. How can we put this into a scale of textual heritage, which I feel the real potential of this category is not just having, you know, bringing out popular stories, but really bringing it to all kinds of textual heritage and, and look at the relationship, the dialogue or the lack of that, no? Mm. At the time. So I think I'll leave it there, but really uh, yeah, thank no, you thank very you. much. There's for a lot, yeah, a lot there. Yeah, circulation, audience, authors, uh, in some ways, yes, yeah, circulation, there's, in terms of the, 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 it obviously became a tourist attraction locally and people would walk or, or for, ride from neighbouring parishes to see this in the events afterwards. But the pamphlets themselves, the ones we've got, are published in London uh, and sold. Uh, the first ones, are just, the first versions are quite cheap, I think just two or three pence. And then, but the big, the longer one is sixpence. And I think that's actually quite a lot of money. And so, uh, and that was... Uh, and the, the, whoever printed that uh, within a month afterwards, uh, by the looks of it, had actually paid for eyewitnesses to come to London. Uh, and so maybe they, it, it could be a case that they, they sold these pamphlets while uh, parading these witnesses in, a, in, in taverns in central London or places in central London at that time. So it could be, you know, this was, that, that was the, the circulation was getting, seemed to be in the immediate aftermath was, Getting this, getting this, this story to London, and then circulating from there. Uh, and uh, um, we we found that there's another storm a few few years earlier in Norfolk, where a church floods and various people happen, and a very and a similar story happens. There's certain people got killed in in Norfolk in the northeast of London, 
but then it appears in London quite soon afterwards. That's where that, that's the sort of heart of that publishing. In terms of the audience, you can uh, tell a bit from, uh, I guess, from the expense of some of these things that the, it, the, that uh, you know, the, buying these pamphlets did cost money. Um, and I guess in relation to that, it's the sort of the authorship. This is something where, I mean, Joanne Parker is my, the colleague who's worked on this. She's, she's an expert on Dartmoor writers. So Conan Doyle and lots of others as well. So she brings a lot more to, to, to it than, than I do on that. But uh, she's, she, but it, the, the people like Richard Hill, who writes it up on the, on the, note, on the, on the church wall, uh, is a slightly different story and is almost conscious that the people who are reading this are actually the parishioners. They don't want to be told they're all sinners and they're going to die. So uh, we have to sort of, it's sort of, oh yeah, thank the Lord that we did, we, not all of us died. Then there's a sort of, we'll do that. Whereas John Prince, who writes about it in the uh, early, early 18th century, uh, again, I'm not a literary scholar, but from Joanne's, what, what Joanne says, that uh, the style of poetry that he's using is quite a, is, is quite a, a, a lot more sophisticated, is a slightly more upper class style of poetry. And it's quite revealing in a sense that although he notes that the tablets are on the wall of the church, he doesn't say what's on them. He just notes that they are there. So that's why we don't know what they actually said at the time. We presume that the ones that were, that were transferred in 1780s said, said the same or something similar, but we don't know for sure because it was beneath him to actually write up such terrible rhymes. He wasn't going to, he wasn't going to lower himself to write, write that story. Instead, he was going to do his own version in a much more sophisticated poetry. So that was a sort of circulating in a probably a slightly different sphere of people than the, the Richard Hill, local, you know, very much local orientated on the church towers. Um, in terms of the, yeah, the biography and how, how to use it, that, yeah, absolutely evolving, uh, I don't know, the evolving life of, you know, in dialogue of an actual event. I'm trying to think, is it, is it an event or is it a, you know, is it a story of an event? There's, there is an event, but by the time we get to the later stories, most of the most of the detail is is uh, uh, is largely trans you know ra ra largely translated to other other elements being brought in about the, the the fields and the stopping off at the pub and various other things. There's a kernel of something that was in there, but it's is interesting how that that uh, uh, something that really did happen ends up transferring on or or to, to ends up evolving. Through through dialogue between different peoples at different times and different different forms of different forms of text, both literal you know how, you know writing text and printed text, but also landscape as text uh, in conversation. In terms of the and the voices, really yeah, really interesting. It's something as you said, I'm, I'm quite keen to try and pick up on here, and I find it interesting that the the very very first accounts of these things it talks quite very clearly about how. The minister says, "There's no better place to die than in the church," and the and the congregation answers by running for their lives. And I can't help thinking there's a bit of a joke in there somewhere that there's a sort of that there's a there's almost the the congregation are, uh, have a voice by their react by their reaction to what's going on to the authority of the minister saying, "Everyone sit where you are and pray," and they're right, I'm off. And it's uh, and there's there's almost like the shadow of a of a of a of, you know. Uh, of the you know through the congregation's actions, the shadow of that a voice of that of the more ordinary people reacting to this traumatic event taking place around them, and it's and in some ways the the but the end point in this is that the mining and the the lives of the miners in the late 19th, early 20th century completely obscured. They're just complete. They're nowhere in this at all. There are other legends about miners and and so on on Dartmoor, but in this particular instance the the fields that were actually made by miners in probably within living memory or thereabouts and when people like William Crossing writing about he's publishing his stuff in about 1903 1905 uh, and it's probably within living memory the fields were made um, by people who he probably walked past in the road in order to go there but he much preferred the story of the devil and he just misses out the fact that there are hundreds and hundreds of miners who are, who are working these fields around him as he was there, and and they, they get completely obscured by that by the latter stages of these these uh, legends. That's okay. We do we thank you very much, and we have so so many to talk about. Actually, we, we did a little mistake on the on the 
on the program, on the pamphlet. The, the drink is not from uh, one o'clock, but it's from uh, one and a quarter, one fifteen. So we have more three minutes if there is there are any other questions, uh, even including yesterday's interesting. Perhaps I can jump in and ask a yes. question if that's all right. <clears throat> but maybe someone else is also typing in the chat in the meantime. Anyway, I was uh, I was really thank you very much for this wonderful uh, presentation. Very informative. I I don't know almost anything about the topic myself, but I was um, particularly fascinated by um, the archaeological remains. This this later layer of archaeological remains of the coal mine coal mines. And I was wondering if you could tell us something about whether you, you have thought of ways in which your retelling of the story of the story can bring to light this other dimension of, of people who were working there, but were also, you know, there is also a political or ethical side to this with the fact that they were marginalized to some extent. I wonder if, if, for example, if tourists visiting the place can actually feel this, the, the, the various layers uh, today, or whether we can do anything to, to enhance this, these various dimensions when we actually visit the place. Yeah, I guess the only, well, I suppose within, within the legends, the only reference to it is that the Jan Reynolds, Jan Reynolds, he is in some, some of the accounts, he is described as a tin miner who is uh, who has uh, a bit of gambler, and so you end up thinking, well, is sometimes he is, sometimes he isn't. But it's uh, and is is there a case that there's the tourists who want to go there to find out about these legends? There's this nasty tin miner who's a gambler who gets taken away by the devil and killed, or something. Is almost like a is a sort of like a is maybe as an open question as a sort of is there a late nineteenth, early twentieth century. Um, uh, a you know, sort of anti-industrial uh, feeling there that these these horrible dirty tinners are coming here and the devils who take them away or something. I don't quite know. In terms of you know, there's a sort of there's only a few accounts where it talks about them as a tin miner. But the uh, in terms of nowadays when you go there, yeah, if you there is uh, there's there's I, it's it's interesting if you go to the Dartmoor National Park Centre, right up at Princetown, their main museum and so on. There is in the back room, there is little bits and pieces about mining and mining history, tin mining and so on. But uh, the, the figure who you meet as you walk in through the front door is a gigantic uh, replica of Sherlock Holmes. So they very much buy into uh, the fictional figure and they want to tell you, they want to sell you the romance. Uh, if you go to the, the Museum of Dartmoor Life, in the town of Oakhampton at the northern edge of the moor, then that is much more, uh, it's curated by locals rather than national agencies, and is much more about uh, tin mining and lots more about mining, lots more about farming, lots more about other, uh, other activities. It's a, it's a peopled landscape, which the, that, that museum tells the story of. So I, I guess if you turn up to Dartmoor as a tourist, without any knowledge at all, you might be a little bit confused if you go to all of these places, because at one minute you're told this is a, an amazing wilderness, an empty landscape, and another minute you're told this is full of life and people, people make, you know, making a living. Um, and, uh, and although there are both sides of this in, in various ways, largely if you go to the National Park Centre, you get the, the romantic wilderness. Thank you. So um, I don't see any other questions. Um, so I, I say thank you again to Professor Harvey for this very inspiring and wonderful talk that in my opinion responded well. It was a, a, the, the, the second time of the first day. It, it perfectly introduced our second day of symposium. So we get um, 15 minutes, 40 minutes break and we start at 1.30 with the next speaker, with uh, Dr. Ian Narilli. So see you later. Okay. Thank stay, you just for your questions. Connected. See you in, in, a, in a few minutes.
Yes, welcome back. We're slowly but surely coming back on time. We hope you had a pleasant uh, break, cup of coffee or tea. Um, so as we move on to the afternoon part of the program, uh, let me also say a couple of words as a means of introduction um, for our next speaker also to provide some context. So the next presentation, first of all, takes us from the moors of the United Kingdom to Egypt and Italy, um, interestingly. It's also the only presentation, it was supposed to be the only presentation in, in our program with two speakers presenting together. Uh, however, you know, in, in these times of, of global mayhem and, and global difficulties, basically. Um, yeah, we also uh, experienced some kind of technical, um, well, not only technical, but also personal difficulties. And so Professor Ciampini cannot be with us today. We were very lucky that um, Dr. Yanari Lee was kind enough to uh, basically present for both of them, for the both of them. So without further ado, let me introduce her briefly. Um, so, Dr. Yanerilli is a research fellow for the Chair of Egyptology at Kafoskar University of Venice. As I understand, she works closely with Professor Ciampini. Um, they are currently working together on a project that, if I understand it correctly, <laughs> but please correct me if I'm wrong, um, its aim is to produce a dictionary of ancient Egyptian to Italian. Exactly. And I suppose you will be will will hear about it in a in a second. Um, Dr. Yanarili earned her PhD in ancient history and archaeology at Kafoskeri, with a thesis that dealt with the elaboration and manipulation of the human figure in the pyramid texts. So I suppose the um, there are some continuities with some of the topics we heard yesterday and some and something new as well. Um, like many of our speakers. Dr. Yanerili's work also takes place directly in the field. Uh, she has worked as an archaeologist and assistant director for the Italian archaeological mission in Sudan. I'm not sure, Jebel Barkal, I'm not sure about the pronunciation there. Um, their paper is titled Textualization and Cultural Heritage in the Pyramid Texts, the project Ancient Egyptian Italian Dictionary. Um, you have, of course, around 30 minutes plus 15 minutes of Q&A. So please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks to, to you, Andrea, and to Eduardo for accepting our paper, uh, even though it's chronologically and geographically quite distant <laughs> uh, from many presentations of this symposium. I hope that everything can be clear enough. And uh, as if uh, uh, that uh, wasn't enough, I'm also sick today, but uh, I hope <laughs> Uh, I'm hoping to be clear enough and of some interest to you. Uh, I also bring uh, here uh, the, the, greetings, the greetings of Professor Ciampini, who unfortunately cannot be with us due to a family problem, serious problem. So uh, I will read also his, uh, his part of presentation and uh, I hope uh, he will be able uh, to reply later by mail uh, if you have any questions. So I share my slides. Okay. Can you see it? Okay. So uh, in uh, linguistic anthropology, uh, the notion of text has been widely discussed uh, during the last century, but also in Egyptological studies, and particular attention was given to the locally defined social context and uh, the historical dimension which a text can be produced and uh, received. Over time, uh, crucial aspects have uh, become the production and the reception of uh, a text and its uh, uh, diachronic transmission, is transmission in groups for uh, the construction of uh, a cultural memory. Uh, this presentation starts with a well-defined geographical, social, and chronological context, 
uh, that is the uh, royal necropolis of Saqqara. Uh, we are uh, in uh, Lower Egypt, uh, in Northern Egypt, on, uh, as you can see from the small map on the west bank of the Nile, in the region of uh, Memphis, which is south of Cairo. Um, we are at the end of the third millennium BC, and uh, in this uh, archaeological site, the very first builder of a pyramid, uh, the famous King Jezer, had begun a gradual but irreversible process of establishment of the pyramid as a, a royal tomb. Uh, that will be a symbol of the old kingdom, but um, in the common imaginary of ancient Egypt in general. Uh, also here were buried uh, the kings of the 5th and the 6th dynasty, about uh, 2350, uh, 2150, um, especially five of them, namely uh, Eunice, uh, Pepi the First, uh, Teti, Pepi the First, Merera, and Pepi the Second, but also their uh, queens. Um, in whose pyramid uh, the texts that are the subject of our study are preserved. Um, as you can see from these uh, figures, uh, um, in uh, uh, the, the outside of the pyramid, uh, this one is the pyramid of the first king, Unis, and the, the, the outside of this building is very uh, damaged, but uh, the, uh, the preservation of text inside is, uh, uh, is quite good, it's quite amazing. And uh, um, you can understand that these spells, these spells cover uh, the walls. Uh, of the burial chamber, so the, the chamber in which uh, was preserved the sarcophagus, the uh, antechamber, and the, the corridors between these uh, uh, these rooms. Um, as well stressed by the Egyptologist Harold Dice, uh, the advent of the pyramid text during the Old Kingdom represents a crucial moment for the writing history of Egypt, monumentalizing a ritual script and transforming it into a permanent ideational representation. It is indeed important to underline that uh, this burial chamber of the pyramids uh, had previously been undecorated. So, uh, for example, in the famous uh, pyramids of the uh, Giza Plain, uh, the, the, the three famous pyramids, uh, uh, which are older and uh, well preserved, um, you will not find any, any text inside the burial chamber, they are empty. Um, so uh, it's uh, uh, important to underline this fact because uh, uh, this text constitutes uh, the oldest Egyptian religious corpus. It is possible that in their original formulation, the content of this text uh, must have already existed in different contexts uh, before the pyramids. Uh, um, these pyramid texts are uh, the manifestation uh, probably of a wider body of mortuary literature um, some part of which were also copied on perishable materials, so papyrus uh, and uh, wood uh, and so on, so they are probably lost. But briefly summarizing the story of this text, we can recognize uh, a process of the uh, so-called intextualization of uh, uh, the body of oral recitation, probably oral recitations, used in a variety of settings, uh, the mortuary cult, but not only, also festival and uh, private magical practices, probably. This recitation would be removed from their original context, coherently organized, fixed in writing, and monumentalized, monumentalized on stone, uh, specifically on the inner walls of these pyramids of Saqqara. Uh, this complex process uh, could have been the result of an intellectual speculation promoted by the priests uh, of Memphis, um, uh, which is the religious center of the period, who selected uh, specific passages of these uh, uh, pre-existing materials by their affinity with the uh, post-mortem uh, path of uh, the dead king. Um, and uh, uh, the aim of this spell is indeed to, um, we can say, to provide a magic aid uh, to the king and to follow him in his uh, afterward uh, path. Thinking of uh, uh, textualization as the circumstance when a text come into existence, um, the carving of the pyramid text in the burial chambers of Saqqara constitutes a key turning point in uh, Egyptian literary history and memory, revealing some interesting aspects of its cultural identity. Three are the main characteristics of this uh, identity. Uh, the first one is the iconic nature of the hieroglyphic system, 
whereby the science of writing can potentially represent the whole reality uh, surrounding the writers. Um, second is the choice of an eternating, I don't know if it's a word, but eternal support uh, such as stone. And uh, uh, last but not least, the important gate to funerary context and more specifically to the royal tomb. With regard to the first point, we have to remember that the Egyptian writing system is uh, uh, extremely iconic, distinguished by uh, magical and performative values. So all uh, the signs uh, bear the characteristic of existence and dynamism. As a result, uh, uh, performative, performative and magic processes are an integral part of the structure of the hieroglyphic system. About the second point, we can say that the um, prevalent function of uh, writing, especially in this period, uh, in this old period, uh, is to sacralize the message through support, image, and language, which, as stated by Pascal Bernou, uh, are the three signs of sacralization. For the pyramid text, uh, the support is uh, the stone, which is durable, if not undestructible uh, material, and the channel is the image, uh, itself that is not only a graphic medium, but uh, the object of the satyr itself. And finally, regarding uh, this third point, we have just to state that the funerary context is considered as a, a delicate environment requiring specific uh, uh, precautions, especially when uh, it's also a royal environment. This emphasis um, on the funerary context, that together with the sacrality and the active value of the hieroglyphic writing, uh, is the reason for some particular modification applied to the signs in the pyramid text. Uh, specifically, anthropomorphic or uh, teriomorphic signs are treated in such a way as to be inoffensive. You can see uh, here um, uh, that uh, the, 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 some uh, anthropomorphic sign, human signs are uh, deprived of uh, legs or head or a portion of uh, the body. But we have to note that uh, uh, to be omitted or to be halved, to be partially represented, are um, always the uh, classifiers. So uh, signs uh, uh, lacking a phonetic value, uh, which uh, uh, therefore uh, have to be always linked with the phonograms and logograms, and that usually follows names or action expressing and clarifying their semantic field. So in the first example, you have uh, hem s, so two phonetic signs here, and the third sign is just a classifier, so it expresses the semantic uh, field of this uh, uh, word, of this action. And uh, uh, you can see that in different uh, pyramids uh, of these uh, kings, uh, the, um, uh, the elaboration of this uh, uh, sign is different. So in Unis uh, is completely avoided and in uh, uh, the other kings is partially represented just with the upper part of the lower part of the body. Um, it is possible to note that in these examples, uh, uh, the meaning of the lexemes uh, uh, gives no uh, reason for their modification since all of them can be affected by an omitted human sign. Uh, regardless of whether or not, if, uh, or not they have a negative meaning. Uh, and for example, here you have uh, this uh, action, which is uh, to defend Hezeb, uh, an aggressive action, we can say, uh, but the same treatment is reserved to words with an armless meaning, like to sit, to purify, and so on. This is explained by the fact uh, that the images, the images, so the signs themselves, are endowed with an intrinsic power. Another meaning of the term they are bound to. So it is the graphic element uh, of the sign and not only its content that must be uh, considered. All of this uh, explains in part the nature of the hieroglyphic writing system, where signs are not only the messengers of a spoken language, but they connect in the very moment in which they are uh, written, or in, in this case, engraved on stone. So modifying or removing something for, uh, from the uh, written word uh, means preventing it from acting and uh, uh, eventually endanger, in this specific case, the king, the dead king. Then, at the end of the Old Kingdom, several sequences of this uh, pyramid spell uh, will appear also on uh, Middle Kingdom coffins in the first half of the second millennium BCE. 
and the high degree of adaptation of this corpus causes also a variegation of textual patterns, generating innovative graphic and semantic forms and adapting to new contexts. So now I want to interrupt my part to read the presentation of Professor Ciampini uh, that is focused on these uh, later texts. And then I will come back at the end, sorry. So. Okay. The mechanism of the process, uh, um, Sorry, I'm reading. Uh, the, mechanis the mechanism of the process is that of copying, but a closer analysis reveals something more. The transition from the Old Kingdom epigraphic models to the Middle Kingdom version, 3rd millennium, 7th millennium BCE, represents the older evidence of a typical pattern of Egyptian culture. The connection between the old and the new version of the same corpus can be defined as an updating rather than a simple copy. Um, a number of features must be emphasized that uh, depend on the nature of the old kingdom epigraphic models. According to a classical Egyptological leitmotiv, the old kingdom pyramid texts are effective words that connect on reality thanks to the performative nature of the hieroglyphs. This statement configures the corpus as an eternal rendering of those recitations that describes the pharaoh's access as a god in the afterlife. Uh, that is the aim of the, the king in, in his afterlife uh, uh, path. The nature of the text is confirmed by uh, some specific elements. Uh, that means, uh, uh, such as the lack of titles, uh, that means the lack of a traditional evidence for the textualization of this corpus. And uh, the expression uh, you can see here, Jed uh, Medu, which means uh, uh, say words or better recitation. Um, at the very beginning of uh, each column, that directly depends on oral tradition. So you have this uh, snake uh, with the stick, uh, that means uh, uh, say words. Um, and is uh, an oral evidence probably uh, part of a more complex profile of the corpus. As uh, already uh, recognized by the German scholar Zete, who gave the Editio Princeps of the Pyramid Text, the spell are framed in an architectural structure uh, identified with the temple, this one, also uh, here, uh, temple in Egyptian hut. This arrangement can surely be a rational organization of an epigraphic uh, and, and eternal discourse, but it could also be the evidence of the divine nature of hieroglyphic signs often called uh, gods in some inscription dated uh, to this period. All this data uh, lets us understand the role of the epigraphic writing in the construction of the royal afterlife, uh, a place where the king is truly a god, thanks to the power of the written gods, uh, hieroglyphic signs. After the collapse of the old kingdom, the funerary literature evolves in a new tradition. The texts are now widespread in several Middle Kingdom necropolis. Uh, we are at uh, the beginning of the second millennium this year. And the classical support for them is the inner surface of the private people uh, coffins. So not kings uh, now, but private people, uh, where the texts are arranged in vertical columns with a cursive ductus. This text mainly consists of a new literature published uh, as a coffin text by uh, the first scholar who translated uh, them. But beside uh, the new funerary literature, these coffins also include some version of the older uh, pyramid text. Um, and uh, we can recognize some editorial features uh, directly depending on the process of uh, textualization. The version of the pyramid text on Middle Kingdom coffins uh, that uh, we, uh, con we take in consideration for our uh, project of the Egyptian dictionary, about which uh, I will say something later, are uh, the first step of a long tradition, well known also in later times. Uh, the royal textual model is transferred to uh, a new context in a new textual shape. We are here dealing with the, the thorny topic of the book concept in the Egyptian culture, analyzed by Jan Asman. The textualization of the pyramid text in Middle Kingdom version does not represent a canon a canonization, but rather an example of uh, open recension. Thus, the formal feature of the text in the coffin is a, a direct out outcome of copying. So it's a systematization, uh, but not a canonization. 
um, the Middle Kingdom pyramid text respects the formal arrangement known for the coffins. They display in vertical columns with a cursive ductus and some other formal solution. Uh, all this provides an Egyptian textual heritage, a phenomenon supported by a new metatextual information, such as the red inserts with title or technical information concerning the recitation and the, the related acts that must follow this recitation. Uh, the cursive ductus and the red ink mark the book nature of the redaction and the use of titles are a typical support for the textualization because they make the funerary materials ordered in a rational frame. The transfer of the royal corpus to the new context is characterized by the cursive ductus that seem to express uh, a different concept of the graphic arrangement. The epigraphic version represents a semantic model for tradition, a version where the hieroglyphic sign play an effective role in the concept of the text. The value of this semantic model is clear enough in some specific uses of this royal text in the Middle Kingdom coffins. It's interesting to note that the role of the royal person, uh, sorry, to note the role of the royal person in the construction of the text. The first evidence of this uh, redactional activity on the ancient model can be found in a passage from the, uh, this spell from um, where the Old Kingdom version, uh, the, the pyramid text version, runs, anyone who will say evil in the name of Unis, uh, meaning uh, anyone who can curse the pharaoh, the king Unis, but the same text in Middle Kingdom version becomes anyone who will say evil in the name of the king. This variant in the tradition of the model focuses on the role of the king. He is no longer the recipient of the spells, but an actor, an actor whose presence guarantees access to the afterlife for the common deceased to whom the sarcophagus is dedicated. Uh, uh, so the king is an integral effective part of the written text, you can see in this case. Um, another evidence for the textualization process is the presence of the titles often written in red. Uh, in uh, pyramid text, we, uh, we had no uh, the titles added to the old spells, so we can find the concrete evidence of the technicalization. The final result of the process is that the old and the new funerary literature are combined in the same formal solution, ruled by a coherent organization of the Materia Sacra. We can find a good example of title in this sequence of spells uh, of the coffin of Rerut from Meir um, in Middle Egypt. This se uh, sequence has been identified as a ritual of uh, resurrection and the title runs Spell of Transfiguration after the revision of the offerings. The meaning of the ritual is summarized by the two concepts, uh, the funerary ritual uh, that ensured the access to the afterlife marked by the transformation in uh, an Ak spirit. So this Ak spirit is a, uh, can be translated as a, a transfigured a glorious being. And uh, uh, the second is the ritual revision of the offering that gives uh, a new life to the dead. The refined work of adaptation of the model is characterized by a classification perfectly coherent with the scribal culture of the period. A physical rendering of the textualization can be found in the frieze of the coffin of Sepi here, from the necropolis of Deir el-Bersha, where among other items, uh, there is a, a writing board uh, with the incipit of the spell 213 of the pyramid text. In this decoration of the coffin, the text is transformed in a tangible element of the funerary equipment. Uh, so another step in the process of textualization, which is typical of the Middle Kingdom culture. And uh, this uh, uh, version of the pyramid text in the coffin of Neferi, always from the same necropolis, uh, is a version published in 1977. And uh, here the editor stressed um, how some portion of the pyramid text are better preserved here in this coffin than in older sources. Um, and a textual feature, interesting textual feature, is the insert of ritual information at the end of some uh, columns, similar to titles. But a very specific feature of the two sequences is the preservation of the name of the old royal owner in a section of uh, this pyramid text on the coffin. Indeed, uh, the uh, lower edge of the coffin on the right still preserves uh, the cartouche of a king 
uh, Wahara Keti, um, a king uh, of the first intermediate period. Of, um, and uh, um, this, uh, this name is preserved in the text of both sides of the coffin. The royal name alternates with the name of the owner of the coffin and the result of this singular mix is another evidence of textualization of the corpus from old to middle kingdom, from the royal to the private context. Indeed, this text displays the registration of names in three different forms. The first is the name of the private dead, uh, Nefer, is here, uh, bearing the title um, Mer, Mer per, Mira per, overseer of the state, and uh, we are dealing with the traditional inserts of the personal name of the personal identity in the construction of the text. But in the same text, we also find other two different ways of identification of the same person. One of these is the cartouche with the name and the title of Neferi uh, here, and uh, the other is the complete royal name in the full and uh, which is the best evidence of the original version of the text in the burial of uh, the king Wah Ka Ra uh, Hedi. The original uh, version of this text is lost, but we can suppose that it was a cursive version from the royal coffin and not an epigraphic uh, redaction from the tomb walls. And the presence of the royal name testifies to the textualization work done on the original. Uh, which is a good evidence for that uh, cultural process that uh, transformed the pyramid text in a textual heritage. And with this, uh, I come back, <laughs> okay, to my part of presentation, uh, uh, finally to uh, present you this uh, project uh, of ancient Egyptian Italian dictionary. And uh, uh, what has been said so far uh, um, should give an idea of uh, how uh, transcribing uh, a hieroglyphic text uh, uh, onto paper or any other medium uh, um, in any other context hardly robs it, uh, it of its original uh, uh, value. Uh, that is why the elaboration of a grammar of a, or a dictionary, like in this case of ancient Egyptian, is never such a straightforward and simple task. But we are trying, trying anyway, and uh, probably because we are masochist. And uh, mm, this ancient Egyptian Italian dictionary uh, that we are going to present is a joint project supported by Kaposkari University of Venice, uh, the Department of Humanities in particular, and uh, uh, also Instituto per l'Oriente Nallino. And uh, as a part of a project uh, funded by the Ministry of Education uh, and uh, Research and is patronized by the National Academic uh, Union. Uh, is also part of a um, wider project, uh, Dizionari del Vicino Oriente Antico, Ancient uh, uh, Near East Dictionaries, coordinated by Professoressa Simonetta Ponchia of the University of Verona, that aims to produce a series of uh, uh, dictionary, a set of dictionaries of the ancient Egyptian, uh, sorry, of the ancient languages, not only Egyptian, but uh, uh, Near Eastern language, uh, languages also, like uh, Sumerian, Neo Assyrian, uh, Babylonian, and so on. And uh, uh, our ancient Egyptian dictionary uh, is especially based on uh, pyramid text and uh, coffin text, but also on these uh, uh, spells of pyramid text in uh, later uh, um, sources. Uh, because uh, these two corpora uh, show their potentiality both in conveying uh, a millennial textual tradition and uh, modifying their own uh, shape and uh, structure when a uh, recontextualization is uh, required. As you will understand from uh, all the discussion above, uh, one of the major difficulties in the development uh, of the dictionary is the choice of uh, uh, writings uh, to be reported. Mm, for each lexeme, in fact, we uh, could potentially insert uh, six or seven uh, or more uh, uh, graphic, uh, different graphic, uh, um, different spellings. Uh, and uh, this uh, would of course guarantee a great variety of graphic attestation and would uh, respect the context, uh, uh, the, the original context of the lexemes. But at the same time, uh, uh, it would involve an excessive encumbrance, uh, um, also considering that uh, is not our, uh, is not a, our goal and our intention to create an encyclopedic and complete uh, product, but rather an agile tool, a didactic uh, uh, tool which can be used, uh, we hope, both by scholars and by students 
uh, for the time being, we have decided to include a maximum of three uh, graphic variants for each lexeme, only when they are particularly significant and visible, like in this case, uh, for example, you have here a, a um, version uh, of uh, this uh, word, uputi, which means uh, messenger from the pyramid text, two version from the pyramid text, here a complete graphic, uh, sorry, complete phonetic version plus the uh, sign uh, which, uh, the classifier, the, which represents the semantic field, but uh, also um, a logographic uh, version from the coffin text. Um, for each lexeme, uh, so we have uh, one of more hieroglyphic variants, transliteration, uh, translations, of course, uh, and also one of more examples with the uh, related source uh, uh, included. So um, we could say that uh, the history of these uh, oral uh, recitations that uh, perhaps became inscription carved uh, on stone uh, in the pyramids uh, and then again painted on uh, uh, the coffins uh, uh, does not seem to want to stop. and. Uh, uh, this can be maybe a last stage of intextualization of these uh, funerary texts, uh, uh, which from their original context are again moved uh, to a new, new medium and uh, for a new purpose, uh, uh, hopefully a good one. <laughs> and uh, with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Yannarini. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, you, you go there. Yeah. No, it's fine. It's your it's fine. turn. Uh, well, yeah, well, but I know that you do have many questions, Eduardo, but thank you so much, Francesca, Dr. Yanarilli, for, for your presentation. We are not worried about, we're not afraid of the um, specificity of, the, of your work. Actually, we're kind of enthusiastic about um, plunging into some of the details, but many of the questions that I noted myself are probably very superficial or will sound a bit superficial. Um, I, I would like to welcome, of course, um, any questions uh, that may come from the floor in general. Should I start by just, first of all, it seems to me that the, the time span is so wide and the social changes um, alluded just you know indirectly are so many that it's really a fascinating case of of so many different embodiments of, uh, of the same, well, maybe it's not even the same thing per se, but you can see, you can trace so many passages from, uh, we noted down from voice to text, to monuments, to coffins. And I think in parallel, you're drawing our attention uh, to a passage from orality, perhaps, or, so my first question actually is about that. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us something more about the um, the orality of the original um, or the earliest examples we have of this text, and whether you think that this was can be preserved or if it's necessarily lost. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not a simple question because uh, actually we. <laughs> Uh, we do not have uh, any other information about uh, the possibility of the uh, oral tradition, but um, it's just a, a suggestion because uh, in, uh, in the text, in pyramid text, we have some uh, elements of the, uh, some writing elements and the grammatic, we can say, elements that seems to remind to uh, a, a, an oral tradition, uh, like this Jed uh, Medu recitation, this uh, uh, saying, uh, I think here, yes, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this can be considered as a, it uh, writes an oral marker uh, just because uh, uh, it means recitation and uh, all the, um, the, the, the columns of uh, uh, spells starts with this, uh, uh, this marker. Uh, but uh, pyramid texts are the first uh, uh, the first evidence, uh, textual evidence uh, uh, of this, uh, we can say, a religious corpus we have. Uh, so uh, before pyramid text, we have no, uh, um, we don't have a, a similar uh, corpus, or uh, um, we can say that is not a, a narrative, is not considered a, a 
clear, really a literature, but uh, uh, we have just uh, uh, spells and uh, uh, we have uh, some text in uh, private tombs, but uh, uh, it's not the same. It's not, uh, it cannot be considered what we have, it cannot be considered really a religious uh, uh, or ritual corpus. Uh, so is, this one is the first evidence and uh, is, uh, it's not easy to understand if we have uh, something more on the uh, papyrus, uh, for example, or other perishable materials that we have uh, lost sure. before. I see. Thank you. I wonder if that's also. Um, I wonder if that's also a lot, a lot of guesswork, or if we can say whether these markers for recitation were meant to be um, just to signal that these are that these are things that should be or have been voiced. Um, well, anyway. Yeah, probably there are some uh, spells uh, uh, that. Uh, could be uh, orally uh, the claim. Oh, how can I say? Um, yeah, I see. I see what you're what you're trying to say. I wonder if the, the religious there were recitations. So probably they are ritual. There are ritual spellings. Uh, we we can uh, call them in this in such a way. Ritual spellings inside the the entire corpus of pyramids. So uh, probably some of them uh, were part of uh, recitation, part of rituals, uh, um, which were. Uh, uh, Actually, uh, I'm sorry. I, you know, no, no, it's, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. So I, I can find words. So. But I, I was wondering if the ritual. There, I see that there is a question by Vanessa Elbas. I wonder if the if it's the ritual or religious connection there. But um, if if she wants to unmute herself and ask directly. But I cannot see the. Hi. Um, can you see me now? Um, no. Yes. If you yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I'm really interested in this process that you were describing on how, let me see, I took some notes here. Um, this kind of very linear process, it seemed that you were describing of songs, rituals, rit recitation, and then eternalized on stones. And so how we go from this, um, basically this relationship that Andrea's talking about a voice to sacred and ritual and then how it gets put down. And then you had that, that picture of the house or that square with the text inside and the, that relationship to, to the text. And so um, my question is actually about how much do we know about their own relationship to text and if their relationship to text was always uh, that that text forcibly inscribed, as you said later, um, reality, right? So that if you manipulate the signs, then you man manipulate reality. So how how much of that do we know? Did they did they also have like a a secular non ritual literature that we might have some some connection to? I mean, do we know about that? Because I'm wondering also. I think that this connects to the use of word in other ancient cultures as well. And the inscription of word and this, the, the power and the sacrality of word. And so then the interesting thing is in putting that, that sacred word down and like fixing it, then there's something else that happens in the relationship to the sacred. So I, I'm just interested if you could talk a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, I can say that the in general word, so not only um, not only written word is uh, fundamental in the Egyptian cultural, um, um, how can I say, framework and a religious framework because uh, uh, we have uh, uh, gods who create uh, word and other gods through uh, through the word. But uh, in this uh, particular case, uh, we have uh, an, an evidence of the. Uh, um, yes, importance, but not only of the uh, danger, also of the of the world and uh, the in particular the written world, because we are in a um, peculiar context, and uh, uh, and we are using uh, also um, uh, uh, the stone, as I already told you, that uh, is a. Uh, uh, a support which assures eternity, we can say. 
So uh, when you have you, uh, when the scribes, uh, the, the Memphis priests have to uh, put all these, uh, uh, we can say, sacral uh, religious words uh, in uh, um, in uh, in the pyramids, uh, uh, carving them on stone, they uh, really have to to pay particular attention to them because all uh, these uh, signs, not only words. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, each sign uh, can uh, bear um, uh, an effective uh, uh, power. Um, I don't know if it's possible to um, speak about the sort of agency of uh, uh, science, uh, of hieroglyphic science in this case, uh, because uh, uh, for um, writers, uh, scribes, and, uh, and uh, religious uh, um, Memphite priests, uh, these uh, um, these signs uh, uh, are really effective. Um, I don't know if I'm answering to your question, but if you want to ask me more, because I'm probably going. Uh, no, it's, it's it's this relationship. Did they always feel that word was that? Do we have any proof of any other relationship always. to word? I mean, they also had to go and milk the cow and, you know, other things that weren't necessarily. So, I mean, what? Any other? Uh, Anything else? Uh, yeah, but also in later times, uh, uh, we can say that in this period, uh, uh, this relationship with words and in particular written words is, is uh, uh, evident, uh, is particularly strong, but uh, we have also later, uh, um, later attestations of this uh, um, attention given to the uh, to the words but to the written words in particular and um, because it's the same uh, attention uh, uh, egyptians gives to uh, give to images uh, we can say that a word and the image are uh, um, are uh, the same connected yeah but, sorry yeah, sorry connected. if i if i interrupt you so abruptly, but the, the time is running out. So I, I would like just ask a little bit, a, a little question that is related probably to what are, you're talking now. And is, I would like to know something more between the passage between um, figurative uh, use of images and the, the, the write, writing. So uh, I, I don't know anything about uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs. So um, probably I'm asking something I don't know, uh, wrong, uh, but what's the passage between from the image to text? And as I understand in, in the, in the um, hieroglyph, we have a logographic use and a ph phonetic use of characters that is very interesting because it's the same that happens in Chinese, in modern Chinese and on Japanese. And, and so I, 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 will, I was thinking, when is that the, the, the figure of a man becomes a, a character, something that is phonetic, something mm -hmm. which you can say a word about that. Yeah, we have uh, um, many uh, older attestation of uh, these signs and also uh, anthropomorphic signs uh, um, before pyramid text and before also okay. funerary literature, funerary corpus uh, in general. Um, but um, the first attestation are uh, linked with the uh, um, uh, what can I say, at least, so uh, to um, administrative uh, uh, documents, we can say, we have some labels, and uh, in these labels we have uh, uh, already uh, some signs that uh, we can find later, uh, but uh, not always with the same, we can say with the same value. Um, uh, sorry, uh, can you repeat? Okay, yeah, no, yeah, it was, so, so, so there was a, a use of the image, like, things like this, I don't know, uh, yeah. a list of things that are no, I remember drawings the and then become, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and, and right. we have it's not just a, not Sorry for that, the question wasn't very, yeah, probably it's difficult to answer. Sorry, can, can you? As I, as I... Okay, no, I just wanted... Sorry, 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 I don't want to, to make even more confusion, but since I'm, I'm looking at the clock, maybe yeah, it's sorry. a good time to transition. So thank you so much, Dr. Oh, thank you. And really, this was a wonderful, um, very interesting presentation. Before I, I leave the floor to Eduardo, who will introduce our next speaker, um, 
I'm I'm also very thrilled that some of the insight from this from this research seems to me to talk about um, a lot about agency and performativity. So there's there are quite there is quite a lot of, of overlapping with common threats we're encountering. I I wonder I I made a note to myself. I wonder if this presentation could be something like how to do things with pyramid script or something like this, you know, in the sense of the performativity uh, implied in your research. So wonderful, very interesting. Um, I think I will leave the floor to uh, Eduardo to introduce our next. next yes, thank you, Andrea. And so our last speaker of the second day uh, is uh, uh, Professor Heidi Book albulet uh, She's a researcher at the Center for the Study of Manuscript Culture of Hamburg University in Germany. Uh, she studied in Tübingen and Tokyo, uh, both Japanese studies and German linguistics and German literature. Uh, has been awarded uh, a PhD from Tübingen University in Germany in 2002. And, uh, with a dissertation in 2003. Uh, she worked in Tübingen University as a research associate and Heidelberg University as a visiting professor. And she also joined the Center of the Study of Manuscript Culture at the Hamburg University in 2014 and again in 2016. Uh, her research interests include, among others, classical Japanese poetry, rhetoric, uh, gender studies, and manuscript studies. Her current research project at the um, CSMC uh, that is is titled, I, I read it in English, of course, I, I can't read uh, German, uh, Ritual, Aesthetics and Handwriting, Collaborative Poetry in Contemporary Japan, and is founded by the, the Deutsche, the G German Research Foundation. Um, um, under the, the, the Germany's Excellence Strategy, uh, title Understanding Written Artifacts, Material Interaction and Transmission in Manuscript Cultures. Uh, then I, I'm sorry, I, I can't read uh, German, but she published also a number of uh, monographs and publications on, on Japanese literature, basically, I, I suppose. And what I find very interesting, and I am especially happy to have her uh, here today, is that she is I, I think she's doing some kind of field work about these contemporary uh, performances, contemporary performances in the sense of the, the, the heritage performance, the heritage practices, not performances, the practices of, of heritage in Japan. So it brings us uh, to, the, to the contemporary uh, stage. And so I'm really looking forward to, to hear her presentation that is titled Renga revival movements in contemporary Japan. What do they teach us about textual heritage? So the floor is here. Uh, we can hear yeah, you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Eduardo, and thank you for uh, having my presentation included in this wonderful symposium. And now I'm going to share my screen. So nothing happens. Try again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you see my? Okay. Okay. So um, first of all, I would like to apologize because I cannot show you as many pictures as I would like to because I didn't have the time to ask everybody's permission. So um, as I work with uh, contemporary people. So my presentation has two parts. I will start um, with a short introduction uh, to give you an idea of what kind of text uh, Renga is. And this is followed by a very brief uh, history and finally an outline of what role manuscripts and written artifacts play, because this is my task at the Center for the Study of Manuscript Cultures in Hamburg. I will also discuss 
uh, what, why Renga has managed to survive uh, to the present day. The second part will, will be devoted to discussing whether the concept of textual heritage makes sense here. So we uh, can ask what might textual heritage mean in Renga poetry? At least, um, uh, as Eduardo said, uh, heritage as a topic seems to suggest itself because of the activities of transmission I'm going to explain. Um, is textual heritage a suitable tool for studying written artifacts? So um, these two questions should be the guideline of my presentation. First of all, I have to further clarify my subject. When I talk about uh, Venga, I mean a special form of linked poetry, namely classical Venga, uh, which even in its current form uses classical Japanese and also a limited vocabulary that largely excludes ne neologisms and Sino-Japanese words. There were two other forms, the Haikai no Renga, which is now called Renku in present day Japan, which does include everyday language and, and Sino-Japanese uh, forms. And the so-called uh, Wakan Renga, which is a form that links alternate verses in Chinese and Japanese. But these are not the subject of my consideration. So I talk about classical uh, Renga or as I say, uh, neoclassical Renga. So the first thing you have to keep in mind is that Renga is a text uh, that is composed in a group. Okay, that's a... The participants gather at a specific place and a certain time, and there they take turns in contributing verses in order to form a jointly created poem. The art has a history of a millennium if we include its very earliest forms and is still practiced today. However, as I will explain shortly, um, at the begin there was a phase at the beginning of the 20th century when it faced the danger of extinction, but in the end, it was lucky enough to survive. Renga took its basic meter from Waka poetry. And for those among us um, who are not scholars of Japanese studies, I have provided a rather simple explanation and I apologize to the Japanologist if it's too boring. So most of you have certainly heard of haiku and haiku has a meter consisting of 17 syllables or more precisely, morai. The 17 syllables can further divide it into segments of 575, which uh, uh, makes a 17. Um, and if you add to them another 14 syllables, you will get the structure of a waka, which is the most representative form of uh, Japanese poetry. So the 17 part is called a long verse, and the 14 um, part is called a short verse. And if you repeat this pattern, you will get the structure of a renga. To avoid misunderstandings, I am not talking about historical development here. So if you want to put it in a chronological order, it might be rather this way. So as an example, I would like to show you the first three way, uh, verses of a poem called Three Poets at Minase, Minase Sangin, composed in 1488, uh, and this is the most frequently cited Renga poem ever. And I read uh, just uh, the first three verses and you can follow up in the um, English part. Well, uh, of course I should recite it, but I just read it out. Um, Yuki Nagara Yamamoto Kazumo Yube Kana. Yuku Mizu Toku Ume Niosato. Kawakase ni Hitomura Yanagi Haru Miete. So we start from the first verse or hoku, usually given by the guest of honor, which describes an evening scene of early spring with snow remaining. To this, a second verse is added, which introduces an olfactory aspect to the scene. And then these two get verses together, only these two, form a new image. However, when the third link is added, you forget about the first one and you just uh, look at number two and number three. And then we have the, the wind introduced and the willows and these form a new image. So this is a very basic uh, technique to ensure a constant change of images in the poem. And it is called Tsukei in Japanese. 
So to this, a complex set of rules is added. It consists of a catalog of possible motives. I explain it shortly. Rules of intermission and rules of seriation. These rules known as Shikimoku were established during the 13th and 14th centuries and they came to be codified in rule books, the prototype of which became Renga Shinshiki or new rules on Renga, which was compiled in 1372. And this is still in contemporary Japan, the, the reference book upon which the Renga practice is based. So this is butate, the semantic categories. So if you uh, remember the verses that I, res, uh, that I read out, uh, so we have the mountains in the first verse. Um, so this would be uh, the Yamamoto, the foot of the mountain would uh, refer to the category of mountains. We have Kasumu, uh, this is the, um, the spring uh, haze, which uh, falls into the category of rising things. We have the willows, which are plants. And we have the water, uh, which uh, refers to the category water. To this, another category is added, the four seasons, spring, summer, autumn, winter, and the fifth category, uh, which is non-seasonal. So every verse may be one, category, uh, uh, one um, season or non-seasonal. So the Butate categories and the seasons are, are to be distributed in a way that makes the poem a harmonious work. Two basic regulations serve this purpose, the rule of intermission and the rule of seriation. An example uh, for seriation or kukasu, uh, spring has to be continued. Uh, I wonder if you can see it. For, uh, for three verses and not more than five verses. Love, for example, uh, have to, has to be continued for um, two verses. And just one example for intermission, mountain. Um, so if, if um, mountain is referred to in a verse, an intermission of five verses is required until this motive may appear again. In Brima Japan, these rules were called Sari Kirai or Kirai Mono, but in contemporary Japan, they are called Kup Sari, which means distance between verses. These are the rules as they are practiced in contemporary Japan and the charge um, um, of which I uh, show you some details uh, here have been created by Mitsuta Kazunobu as a systematization of the rules in Renga Shinshiki. So before we uh, turn to the written artifacts, I have to remind you that Renga is a collaborative art. A typical Renga consists of a Renga master, the scribe, and the group. In pre-modern Japan, during a Renga session, the scribe records the co recorded the contributed poems. He had to follow rules of conduct, conduct that were as strict as the rules for the poetic work itself. But above all, in pre-modern Japan, the recording of the emerging poem was exclusively done by the scribe. In contemporary Japan, on the other hand, every member, including the scribe and the sosho, make a record. And I will talk about that in a moment. But first, for the manuscript form that, that emerged from the activities of uh, pre-modern Renga. Um, So this um, manuscript is called, uh, are called Renga Kaishi and that uh, literally means chest paper because it could be kept in the chest part of one's clothing. So the Kaishi was sized about uh, 36 by 52 centimeter um, and folded once like you can see it here, uh, yielding a folded piece of paper, a Japanese odi approximately 18 to 52 centimeter in si uh, size. Only the outer, outer part of the paper was used. So we have a recto and a versal side uh, for each body or folded sheet. And if you ha have a look at the Pada text of the Renga Kaishi, you can see some of the dynamics of the performance reflected there. So we have um, 
um, the date of the meeting on the utmost right, or possibly the venue also, and then a blank space covering about one third of the first page recto. Then we have the title and the verses. The, the verses are written in two lines and uh, below the two lines, I couldn't make a sign here. So there are the written uh, the names of the poets. On the last page verso, you have again uh, the, the verses and you can have here, can you see my cursor, the, a, a tally uh, which tells you which poet has uh, contributed how many verses. Okay, and this is a, um, this is a, um, a manuscript that's, uh, that ha has been written in 2015. Um, it's in my possession, so I can show you. And this is um, exactly uh, following the traditional style. And so this is the um, versa page. And you see here on the, you see the tally. Now the verses were distributed on the kaishi in such a way to have eight on the first page recto and eight on the last page verso and 14 on all the other sides. That means you need uh, for 100 verses, which was the standard in, uh, in pre-modern Japan, you would need four sheets. And um, then if you take the middle two sheets out, you will get 44, which is the standard in contemporary Japan. So this layout structure had an effect on the structure of the text. For example, a page break made also some kind of cesura in the text, and some rules were also page-based. For example, certain motifs were allowed, allowed only once uh, on, a, on a page or on a folded sheets, for example. So once this layout had been established uh, around the end of the 14th century, it remained remarkably stable for centuries to come until this day. However, in contemporary Japan, new forms of manuscripts have developed, but they have also adopted this structure. Now, every member of a circle makes their own record using a two-sheet form developed also by Mizuta Kazunobu, and it's also called Kaishi. And I show you a detail of the first, pay, uh, of, uh, of the first page of the Kaishi, uh, showing, uh, rep representing the first page uh, recto of a traditional kaishi. Um, and it's interesting to, to uh, you, you can see here the, the season, and here would, you, you would write the, the, poet, uh, the, the poem, and here is an overview of the possible um, topics, and uh, this is access, this means you cannot uh, use these topics at this part of the poem. And here you would write the name of the poet. Okay. Um, a very short history. Denga, as I told you, has a history of a millennium if we include its very earliest forms in the Heian period. In 1200, we have the first written mention of a Renga with 100 verses and the first semi-official anthology of Renga in 1356 uh, indicates an increasing institutional acknowledgement of the art. In the beginning of the 17th century, Renga started to decline. There were tendencies of ossification of reaching a stage where innovation was hardly possible anymore. Here, a less formal form of linked poetry developed out of Renga. This new form, which allowed everyday language and Sino-Japanese words, came to be known as Haikai no Renga or humorous Renga. Thereupon, more and more Renga circles changed to this new up-to-date form. But this was not the only condition that was unfavorable to Renga. In the middle of the 19th century, with the forced opening of J Japan, by the United States, after more than 200 years of nearly isolation, the Tokugawa regime broke down and the political and the administrative system faced a fundamental restructuring that affected all levels of society. Moreover, with foreign power, powers came Western knowledge and new ideas of aesthetic, which led the poet Masao Kashiki to his famous saying, Hoku, and he 
it talks about haiku here. Hoku is literature, Renga and Haikai are not. So why is it that Ren classical Renga finally managed to escape this extinction? Renga survived as, as part of rituals at the court of the shogun and local lords, but mostly at shrines and temples in the shape of votive Renga or Horaku Renga in Japanese, whereby Renga were composed as a gift to the deities and the kaishi were donated to a temple and or shrine. In general, however, by the end of the 19th century and by the latest, after the 1930s, Renga ceased to be conducted all over Japan, with the only exception of a small parish centering around Imaizu Suzajinja Shrine and the Chokichi Temple in Yokohashi, Fukuoka Prefecture in Kyushu, claiming an unbroken tradition of Horaku Renga for nearly 500 years, beginning in 1530, when it was included in one of the performances of Gion Festival. The Gion Festival in uh, Yokohashi is, by the way, designated an intangible folk cultural pop property of Fukuoka Prefecture, Fukuoka Ken no Muke Minzoku Bunka Zai. So at, it was from this shrine that in the 1980s, a revival movement began, the result of which is that Renga is being practiced again at many places in Japan. The merit is largely due to the then priest of Imaizu Suzajinja, Takazuchi Yasujika. He lived from 1933 to 2004. He was aware of the fact that the linked poetry of Imaizu Suzajinja would probably likewise not be able to be maintained if the number of persons able to compose Renga remained limited to such a small circle. He then started to contact persons who had a passive but all the more profound knowledge that is the literary scholars researching and teaching at universities. Two symposia conducted in 1981 and 2003 were to become milestones in the renewal movement. Both were attended also by many well-known researchers of literary history. And there were also events at a national, prefectural and local level that provided the occasion and the institutional framework. The symposium uh, of 1981 was uh, preceded by the Showa period reconstruction of Imaizu Susa Jinja Shrine. The second symposium was embedded in the preparations for the 19th National Cultural Festival Kokumin Bunkasai. The Kokumin Bunkasai was inaugurated in 1986 and was to take place in a different prefecture each year. In 2004, it was the turn of Fukuoka Prefecture in Kyushu. It was also in this year that the Renga was for the first time included officially as one of the arts performed at the festival. With the ignition, especially from the first symposium, other plays followed in reintroducing Renga circles, such as Kumata Shrine in Osaka, where circles were inaugurated in 1987, or in Yamaguchi, where it started by the latest with the first, uh, 21st Kokumin Bunka Sai in 2006. In an essay that I published last year, I have summarized the activities as reflection, adaptation, and promotion. And I would like to add a fourth one, networking. So reflection means thinking and researching the history of Renka poetry. While the initiative for the revival came from a shrine priest, many of the protagonists were scholars of classical poetry teaching at universities. Adaptation means the participants at the two symposia were fully aware that some adaptations were necessary to adjust Renka to the needs of contemporary poets. For instance, the 44 verse Renka was decided as a new standard instead of 100, and the complicated rules were systematized and graphically prepared to make them easier to handle. You remember the charts by Mizuta Kazunobu I showed you. Um, moreover, haikai verses came to be allowed, and that's very interesting, in the inner part of the kaishi, in the inner part of the poem. Third, promotion activities include holding renga, uh, regular renga um, circles, the organization of events such as public competitions, pupils, uh, renga conventions, 
And many of these activities are directed towards pupils and some of the protagonists are teachers at elementary, secondary or grammar school. And this is a scene from an elementary school in um, Osaka. So much for the very rough literary and social history background, we can now ask what textual heritage might mean. With this compound expression, we have, of course, two variables at a time that would need cl clarification, text and heritage. Of course, there are endless possibilities to approach the phenomenon of text. With regard to analyzing Renga poetry, one of them would be a catalog of traits that define textuality or the quality of being a text. So we have, for example, text cohesion and uh, as I told you before, there are rules to ensure that the jointly composed renga makes a harmonious whole. And in Japanese, you would call this yukiyo, so a, a harmonious progression of the poem. Another would be intertextuality. And uh, if you remember the first verse of the poem I just uh, gave you um, uh, before, Yuki Nagara Yamamoto Kasumu Yube Kana. So, this is a quote or a, an allusion of a um, poem by uh, uh, Emperor Gotoba. Uh, and this uh, Minase is, is, is a shrine dedicated to the uh, deified uh, Emperor Gotoba. And so, it was only uh, natural to um, quote. A poem by him in the Hoku, and this is called Honkadori in Japanese. Moreover, a, a text can be represented in several forms, of course, visual, uh, acoustic, uh, handwritten, written, printed, digital, and so on. For example, uh, the submission of the poems in the Renga circles can be done orally, like it's done it in Yokohashi. But most of the Renga circles practice a written form of submission. And for this, they, you, I hope you can see this uh, paper strips lying on the paper. And they would, uh, these are called tanzaku in Japanese, and they would use this paper strip to submit their suggested verse to the scribe. So the, um, if we now think about uh, heritage, the heritage part of the term, the first thing you, uh, to state uh, is that based what and what I have talked about so far in case of text it is not to, so easy to in, separate the intangible from the tangible part. Um, instead we might find a clue in a slogan of the German UNESCO Commission uh, that describes intangible heritage as a Wissen können weitergeben that means uh, knowing being able to or passing on and passing on. So this slogan could just as easily be used to describe what, in my opinion, much of the revival movement is about. It is about the passing on of knowledge and skills. So what then does it mean for textual heritage? In order to get an overview, what is being uh, passed on, we could uh, you think of an inventory using a method based on rhetorical technique of the 5W. So who is transmitting cultural heritage? What is being transmitted? Where do transmissions play, take place? When do they take place? Uh, what are the mo so why, what are the motives for engaging in heritage activities and how is the heritage handed down? Now, if you ask what exactly what skills and what knowledge is being transmitted, what knowledge is, 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 is necessary to, to be able to do a, a Renga, we must say pretty much, pretty much and when I uh, made this inventory, I said to myself, wow, this is quite a list and this is even not exhaustive. Um, so um, yeah, what is my conclusion? Is there a benefit uh, from the concept of textual heritage? I'm afraid my answer will be mixed. Renga on, um, is one of those Japanese uh, arts we in German call a Gesamtkunstwerbel artistic synthesis um, composed of text, performance, and written artifacts. And all of them are embedded in a social setting. If we now rethink this model from the viewpoint of text, then it may be rearranged like this. So we have text grammar and text perform and a text inscription. 
However, what could easily escape our attention with this model is that text is a vital part, but not everything that makes up Venga as an art. So probably the concept of textual heritage will do not full justice to the art because the abilities required are not limited to textual skills. It would probably not do justice to the performance art, which is more than a performance of a text and not to written artifacts, which is more than just um, a carrier of the text. Okay, and just, um, I added this uh, shortly before the presentation um, because um, it reminds me of what uh, Professor Denneke said uh, yesterday, what can we do? We can encourage them to preserve the art. And as you can see from this glimpse of Asai Shimbun, um, it is an encouragement for them if we engage in uh, research of these arts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Bukaldulet. I, I really enjoyed your talk, especially your, your kind of critical uh, approach to this new category we are trying, uh, we are thinking about the textual heritage. I, 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 I think I completely agree with you that text, the textuality is not the only part uh, in, in Renga, of course. And I, I really like that, the, you know, the scheme of text and material uh, the, the calligraphy, the material part, and the, 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 the performance, the kind of performance. That's exactly what, what I find interesting and in, uh, in the idea of textual heritage intended in a wider way. I guess there are many uh, questions. Uh, me too. Well, I, I, so, I, 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 I try to be some kind of um, advocatus diaboli. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, really, I, I enjoyed it. I, I, and probably everybody had um, um, remind the, the, the um, Professor Deneke uh, presentation yesterday, so you have similar experience on this side. Um, if the, I don't know if also Professor Deneke probably has some question, I suppose. I, I find interesting, uh, just a point, just to start. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if I got it well, if it was Masaoka Shiki that said that uh, Hoku is literature and Renga is not. Or maybe it was somebody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah. sorry. And um, so the question is: so what is Renga? And it's it closed the, the the thing. It's a practice. No, it's probably something more. It's not just literature. And and this is probably uh, interesting how historically the, the 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 this form, this artistic form, I, I, I can say literary form. It's not just literary has been understood. So. There is also an historical uh, side that we can, the history of heritage, if you prefer to, to connect to, to Professor Harvey's uh, definition, that is, in my opinion, worthy of, of further uh, analysis. But as I said, the, the, the fact that it's something now, the re revival, this contemporary attempt to revive it and to, to catch the, the UNESCO framework, for example, is another uh, is the other side of, of the heritage problem. I guess there's there's somebody that maybe have something to say. I I, I, I know Andrea took some notes. We have a, a shared uh, uh, notebook, so uh, I don't know if Andrea, you want to add something. I can go on because I have some questions, but maybe it's better to give the word to somebody else. Um, am I hearing? Yeah, thank you very much for this fascinating presentation. I myself don't know much about uh, poetry and almost nothing about Lenga. So it was very informative as well, even though I, I work on Japan, but poetry is not my strong suit. Um, I. I think of the things that I wrote down, one that really was fascinating to me was that this passage from materials back to practice, right? So how, um, how the, the format of the kaishi, for example, in, in contemporary times uh, influences how the practice takes place nowadays. 
Can you say anything? About, can you say something about the um, the influence of those who study Renga? Uh, what kind of influence do they have? You mentioned more than once that prof- university professors were called upon. Can you say something about how they um, influence the the actual performative dimension? Not so much the um, the contents of the of of the poems, but the perhaps how it's uh, how it's yeah performed. Um, well, um, as I said, many, uh, actually many of uh, the professors in, in, in Japan, uh, of Venga professors, uh, many of them work as Sosho, that means Venga master. Um, but at the, by the time in the 80s, it was, um, it was the priest uh, who, who addressed them. And so by, by that time, they were just studying it as a literature. Um, uh, and didn't think of uh, practice and practice themselves. And so they, they, they had a rather slow start, but at least they had a start. And uh, in contemporary Japan, re- uh, really many of the, um, many of the um, participants and um, also the Benga masters are university professors. Um, so um, of course uh, you have to to master all those um, rules that I explained to you, uh, and and so you you need quite a, so uh, well that it's not just the uh, university professors, but you you need a lot of uh, years of experience and practice until you can practice as a master. So I I, I don't know if this um, answers yeah, to you. I think it was the the point. I heard something strange, and um, maybe this was the point that Andrea was was asking. And there is uh, Professor Deneke has a question, so please, if you can unmute yourself, yes. Yes, I'm just looking. If there's somebody else, we can go first. But otherwise, I no, 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 no. Uh, thank you so much for this really fascinating presentation. Uh, I'm. Uh, I was particularly glad for two reasons. First of all, because you really engaged very directly with the textual heritage concept now and kind of enable us to talk to each other and kind of putting that out also with your doubts, you know, about that uh, regarding Renga. Also, as you pointed out, it's really interesting that this is not so much studied by scholars now, although we were just talking about how scholars in Japan facilitate that revival, not the least because it has to do with classical language, you know, expressing the classical language. Um, but that was exactly also my impression, you know, that there are so few, actually n- none of my colleagues really uh, uh, who is studying, you know, Sinitic or uh, a Chinese style poetry is really interested in that. Uh, only people who were, who were like in modern literature are interested more like an anthropological phenomenon. You know? So I think there's really something there um, and resonate with that. So I have two questions. The first question is, is uh, we have actually a situation of what you could call a shared fraternity, you know, these different uh, classical poetry genres um, from Japan that have fared rather differently in the period. I mean, the very courtly Waka tradition still has that kind of uh, official imperial connection every year in January, there's the Utakai Hajime uh, performance. I always show that to students, it's really great to show there has been, you know, centuries really of connection between Waka poetry and for it, and they still compose it uh, and every, basically anybody can participate if they want. Um, uh, then you talked about the case of Renga. Uh, I feel like Haika and Haiku is particularly interesting. I, I have uh, quite a few colleagues who actually who actually kind of sent their little fascicles of published Haiku that they are doing. So this, that seems to be very, very alive <laughs> and kicking. Um, well, and then for, for Kanshi, you know, or Chinese style and Sinitic poetry that I talked about, Yesterday, uh, although there are some kind of pedagogical you know, manuals for composing that and some kind of taikai or kind of competitions, overall, it's I, my sense, uh, a, a, again, but if there are people who know much more about that, please speak up, is that it's more alive really as recitation you know, of texts that already exist to some degree and that where the repertoire then ends in the 20th century. Mm-hmm. Um, and where somehow everything that remains is just that kind of you know performance, so to speak, of that. Um, so I wonder, is there a shared fate in modernity of 
practitioners of these classical forms, the people you're working with in Renga, are they talking a lot about people writing haiku or waka, mentioning kanji, or are these all very separate? As I said, they're somehow to some degree separate fates, no? but the same problem, no? facing modernity. So that's the first question. The second question is, um, I really like that you said, what can we do? Wonderful to see your picture there. And, and you talked of skill aspect, no? So it's almost like a heritage, let's say the Isa shrines that are being rebuilt every 20 years, where you need to make sure that people still know how to use these kind of building techniques. There's a lot of the skill aspect. And I do wonder, um, how do these you know, currently written Renga actually for you stand next life tradition as it was in classical times. Do you feel this needs to be translated into English? Is there a true potential for literary expression for use of that medium in this moment? Or is it mostly really just kind of, you know, preserving skills basically and, and rules from the past? And in relationship to this, I wonder, you know, what you about something we could call really linguistic heritage because here we deal with actually classical language, no? In that sense, uh, you know, this is this is really interesting to think about if people Renga and classical Japanese is still more in the registers, you know, of people reading it, perhaps using it and in, in all kinds. I mean, using it then also when they write, you know, prose and other things. Is there an aspect of preserving linguistic heritage here? And I'm very inspired here by a little anecdote. Sorry, I mentioned this because this is at Venice. Uh, a, a couple of years ago, a uh, conference in Beijing with a lot of classicists who are translating the entire, uh, you know, op opus actually of Ovid, no, uh, Latin poet uh, Ovid into Chinese. Uh, and we were working there also with Chinese classicists, you know, and there was this female professor, young professor who came in. Uh, she didn't know Eng English, the American and European classicists, Latinists didn't know Chinese. And there she was standing and, and spoke in perfect Latin. Uh, and, the, and the Western Latinists were oh my God. And she was trained in Beijing at the uh, YU Dashi, uh, uh, you know, the kind of foreign languages in, uh, uh, university. Uh, mostly, I think, actually through connections with the Vatican. But there's a really interesting revival or kind of a real renaissance now of Latin in uh, China. They are taught, the Chinese students are taught in Latin and in Greek life about Latin and Greek culture. Um, and it's a lot of people being trained there. So I wonder whether we can also throw in this idea of linguistic heritage in the case of textual corpora that are somehow continued now uh, practice again, I mean, not the corpora, but I'm talking about the genres that pre preserve and kind of the skills somehow in that kind of living language of these classic languages. I'll stop here, but uh, thank you very much. Inspiring talk. Okay, thank you very much. I, I'm not sure if I got everything you, you because there's some uh, acoustic problems, but uh, I understand the first part of your question was about the relationship to the other arts and the other poetic forms. And so I, I tried to answer. So when in, in the 80s, um, I think uh, um, the priest uh, Tagatsuchi, he was also a member of uh, Haikai no Renga circles. Um, and also in, in, in present day Japan, many of the poet, poems, because they are all uh, very creative people, uh, some of them engage in haiku poetry and some of them are um, skilled um, calligraphers. Some of them are skilled painters and, and, and also um, create a painted uh, kaishi and, um, and some may also write waka. So there is not so much a kind of um, contact to probably to the haikai no renga or to the venku circles. Uh, because they, I, I think it's, it's a little bit about um, preserving the identity of this kind of art. But many of, uh, of, of the indi individual poets practice, in fact, many arts. And, and as you just mentioned, also, uh, we have this, this kind of um, community art. We have this also in haiku. Even people who, uh, who compose haiku, they would go to, into a haiku club and then share their poems with other and print them and uh, prepare them for publication. And we have this also in Baka has always been a, co a communication art. So 
you are totally right in this. And, and uh, the, I think the third part was uh, about um, um, the linguistic uh, heritage. And I would say uh, it's not just about uh, preserving, well, it's, it's about preserving skills, but I, th I do think this is really a, a living language because so of course people would sit there with their dictionaries and uh, so it, it, it's, it's like a probably like you, you mentioned with uh, Latin, um, it's, it's speaking in a foreign language some, somehow. So e even if, e even if uh, um, probably for a contemporary Jap Japanese to compose the poem in classical language would be like uh, composing it in a, in a foreign language. And, but yes, this is a living tradition and it might seem uh, probably, and, and this is why it probably has escaped uh, research so far, it might seem boring or uh, for, for if, if you don't have the, um, the, the whole knowledge of the art, it might seem boring, but, but even if, if you um, analyze the, the, the poems that are created in these groups, they are full of, um, well, lingu linguistic uh, um, heritage. They are full of uh, quotations from older poetry, uh, from older poetry, just because it may, if it's deliberate or not, but this also, um, also uh, creates a connection to the past, to the literature of the past. And, and I think this is uh, really practiced by, by uh, poets who, who, who just love this art. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's... Okay, I have some feedback. Um, thank you again. And we have another question, I suppose, from Roger Messi. So I ask you to open your microphone. Yep. Thank you very much. Yes, um, thank you very much for the talk. I'd like to run with the I, your point about transmission um, a little bit, um, com bringing it come in a comparison with the work of Professor Nelson yesterday. I mean, if, um, what as I understood it, and I, I, as an outsider, I may have this completely wrong, so I'm happy to be corrected. But um, if looking at Professor Nelson's uh, work, it suggested a, um, a high level of fluidity in, in its active phases that you could say he had a fossil record from the, the 8th and the 10th and the 13th century um, where the notation had radically changed in between or the kanji had been completely uh, subverted and, and changed. And it su suggested that this was like little fragments of, of a fossil record that was incomplete, but attesting to a high rate of evolution um, where the practitioners probably were not, I would have thought, um, that their concern, perhaps as artists and musicians, was not about transmission of a, of a, of a very finite set of rules. But, but so, so you see it changing radically as you go on. Whereas, if I've understood it at all, um, with the Renga poetry, I mean, the, the rules are uh, extremely uh, limiting. And, and I under, as I understand it, to make it uh, transmissible, to make, to make a wider community, I, as I understood it, the rules were somewhat loosened. And is there, you know, is there any comparison? Is, is there any way of, 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 of making a valid comparison there? Um. So um, I, I think the, the, the rules, um, well, I think that the rules are very, very basic parts of, of, of the poetry. And, uh, and you, you should not only think of it as poetry. So Renga in, in, in some way defies uh, uh, these categories. Um, and you, you might also, also think of it as a game or play which does not mean it's not literature. And the rules are um, not only make it transmissible, but the rules are a kind of necessity in order to, to make sure you can uh, play the game. And 
well, and what what has been done to 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 make it accessible to to the contemporary poets is that they were not not necessarily so much loosen it in well in 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 some aspect yes but also um um what uh, professor mitsuda has done was to make it accessible to make it visible to make it comprehensible so but i i don't know if it does your answer your question <laughs> Okay, maybe it's okay like Thank this. You. Thank you very much. And we are, well, we finished our time today. I would just add a uh, thing about also what uh, Professor Deneke said before. Uh, maybe not everybody knows that there is an official petition or movement to make Latin and Greek inscribed in UNESCO uh, intangible heritage. And there is nothing similar about, for example, classical Chinese or, or Kanbun in, in, in Japan. That is something I, I'm uh, reflecting about lately. So Latin is something that is somehow acknowledged as a common, a shared heritage and classical Chinese, maybe not. And, and that's just one point I, I would add. And so I think we can close for today. I, I thank you again, Professor bakal -Bullet. It was a really inspiring and, and perfect conclusion for our second day. If Andrea, do you want to, to do the final remarks? I, um, I shared the I'd, program I'd be for happy tomorrow. To. Yeah, thank you. But this is basically what I would have said anyway. Um, we reconvene tomorrow. I think it would be a very good occasion to, um, to draw together all of the aspects that have been uh, um, discussed over the past two days. In particular, uh, please note that tomorrow we have another kind of heavy uh, long day from 12 to um, 16 hours. So from, from noon to 4 p.m. here in Central Europe. And um, please join us, consider joining us as well for the round table from 3 p.m. Uh, in which we hope we can uh, we can have a profitable dialogue with Professor Deneke and Professor Harvey. That's it, I think. I don't thank you everyone for uh, for coming and staying with us today as well, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Thanks so much.